more people. Okay, we're recording. Um, so I know that more people will be um, joining us along the way. And we realize it's Friday. It's been a long week for ECP if you've participated. My name is Scott Klasky. Um, I'm going to begin this tutorial by giving a brief lecture. And then Norbert Podorsky, um, he'll be then um, not hands-on, but he'll be demoing and trying to explain um, how to really use Adios to get high performance. One of the things that, you know, from this slide that you should understand is that we've had and continue to have a very large team. Some people are very active, but like any other project, other people are less active. Um, Adios was really um, re invented for the ECP. And what I mean by that, we had a piece of code that was written in C. Um, it initially came from me and then some students and then postdocs. And then um, we had more staff. We um, had something that was working that performed well, but we really had to redesign everything. And we continue to make improvements and make Adios better. And I want to um, go through this a little bit. So um, basically, when we look at things, one of the things that we know is that when we look at the beginning of computing, which was in 1943, we had a five kiloflop computer. It was ENIAC. There was no file system. So IO was very simple. There was none. Um, I'm not old enough to remember this system, but basically through the years, what we've seen is that, you know, computing capability has increased by a factor of 10 to the 15th in these last 70 years. But then when you look to see how much file systems have changed and how much performance we have gotten after, you know, once we got a file system, it hasn't proved near that amount. So right now for the ECP, the first US exascale system, it's assembled, it's being accepted, it's um, Frontier. Um, if you're at Oak Ridge, you can actually go and see this. And the point is that this file system is a luster file system along with um, burst buffers, but it's not keeping up. And then when we look at a lot of the different applications, whether they're from the ECP applications or they're, for example, in this slide talking about radio astronomy, there's this huge increase in the amount of data being produced along with there's faster velocities. So what we say is that we have to really perform IO efficiently because the file system and networks are just not keeping up. And one of the first things that we do, we do this in, in our project is really, if you can see this is, we try to understand the simulations, the experiments. So our group has a very rich history of these deep partnerships. And when we start then understanding the technologies, we start understanding what can we do? Generally, we perform research and development in various scientific data management um, algorithms, technologies, which then allow us to then produce software such as Adios. But one of the things that I think from the ECP, everyone's aware is that, you know, since the file systems are not keeping up, there's this whole push for online analysis, online visualization, or another term is in situ. So Adios plays a big part of this ecosystem. And this is what we call the staging and coupling. From there, the other thing that we see is because of the data sizes keep growing, we have to really rethink how data is actually laid out from what you originally have in memory to then as it's, if you wanna say refactored or reprioritized, so that if you're doing in situ, maybe if you can just stream the most important pieces of information first, 
think of like in Fourier saying that the lower um, frequency components move them first before the higher or do other ways to do this, other forms of compression, stream that. And then we have to play a rich part of the analytics and visualization ecosystem. So in this, um, you know, in this talk, we'll, we'll talk about that. But as we see, we have to impact the applications and that's a big part of this project. So this is what I'll say has been my life since a grad student in many of the computers that I have worked on. And one of the things that, again, I'll say is that where I started when I was um, a PhD student in general relativity in physics in 1988 was that I was working on a Cray YMP computer. Texas had one. And it had a 2.7 gigafops processor. But what most younger people don't realize is that did have an SSD. And in fact, it had a 13.6 gigabyte per second bandwidth, or at least that's what a web page says. I, I don't remember the bandwidth back then, but it was pretty easy if you look at the gigaflops to gigabytes per second, we had an overabundance. It was easy to write everything you wanted. And this is really where people started switching from in situ, where we were doing that all the time for in situ plotting, graphing, to then writing files. And visualization really started to take off for this for scientific computing. And then through the time where we know one of the things that was interesting is when Jap the Japanese had the Earth simulator, which had a very powerful vector processor. One of the things is that this made the DOE system and the US say, we have to create these leadership class facilities. And through that, GPUs started becoming ubiquitous in computing to now, this is an Oakridge centric point of slide, but it really shows like where we're at. So when we look, we say, well, the file system went from 13.6 gigabytes per second. to now if you just use burst buffer storage, it's 10 terabytes per second. Well, that went up, you know, several orders of magnitude, three orders of magnitude. Okay, but computing went from gigaflops to exaflops. And you can see the challenge. We're just not keeping up. The other thing that's a challenge is that there's more users on these systems, especially as we're seeing more AI ML workflows. So variability plays a big part when you're mixing more of these workflows. So what that says is as instruments, everything's sharing more data, we have to be very efficient and we have to start to really understand how to tweak all the performance we can. And when, again, going back to when I was a student, one of the things about this was that when I initially in 1993, it was basically saying, well, how do we really understand the numerics? I was working with a multi-grid code that I was developing, and it was basically, how do we really get the IO? How do we perform in situ biz so to have direct feedback? And then going from, you know, 10 years later, when then I was working in Fusion, it became, we were generating so much data for those who were around. In 2003, or actually it was in 2000, NERSC had an IBM SP and users like the scientist Zi Hong Lin with the GTC code I was running, they were running off of a thousand processors at that time. And we were generating a terabyte per second. And from that, that's how Adios was initially born. Well, and then when we look at how we reuse data repurpose along its life cycle, we really understand that we need self-describing data. We need ways to be able to perform everything efficiently. So when I look at what we've done, it's basically saying we wanted to have a simple vision and we wanted to create an easy to use, high performance IO abstraction to allow for 
what we called at that time, data at rest to data in motion work. You can do things online, offline. You can work as streams, you work files, and you don't change your code. Now, to do that, what we had to do is really think about the componentization of I.O. And what's in the figure that's on the upper right is to say, we had to come up with different engines, ones that not just our team could create, but others. The file format, that's the standard one in Adios called BP. We've gone through many transitions. Adios is backwards compatible in that we have BP3 and the latest that was just released in Adios is now BP5. And again, what we're dying to do is really understand what's impacting the apps. But Adios has always and continues to always support HDF5. So you can use our abstractions to read and write HDF5 data. You can also go and use other, what we call inline techniques, in-memory techniques. So one of the exciting things that was released, part of the last release that's part of, you know, that was um, Kitware's contribution is ways to say, you can just have a code which has Adios API. You can then hook Catalyst without changing the simulation. And then it will do the same thing that Catalyst will do, but now you don't even change your code. So this is really good. We also have ways to stream data over the wide area network. That's data man, as well as now we had some um, scientists from Israel contribute um, a net CDF output. And so what we really look at is how do we create this publish subscribe API? And what we wanted to do is separate the IO strategy. So we don't want users to think about striping on Lustre or how do they get more performance. We want basically a very simple abstraction and very simple ways to both write data and read data. I refer to the paper by um, William Godoy. I think he's actually on this call. Um, he wrote this excellent paper about Adios. He was one who took Adios, the old, and rewrote all the lines of code, BC++. We have a GitHub repository as well. So Adios now, just to give some optimizations, we really wanted to do several things. We wanted to avoid the latency of small writes. So one of the first observations is when a scientist says, I'm gonna write this, I'm gonna write this, there's a lot of ways that we do buffering, a lot of ways that we do aggregation. We wanted to have something similar to a log file format so we don't spend a lot of time moving memory around and moving data from different nodes. So there's a lot of things that we do that um, Norbert will be talking about of how do we actually get this high performance. And we have a lot of codes and basically we look at a global tomography code called spec FEM 3D. And you can see that in this case, they are getting two terabyte, whoops. They are getting two terabytes per second measured by them. The general way we measure I.O. is, I would call the most truthful way. We run the code with no I.O. We then run the code with I.O. We took, take a look at the time and the time difference and how much data we wrote out. And that will give how much I.O. This is without compression also. So it's not that we're trying to say that the data is without compression. Adios also has this concept of steps. Steps can be an iteration if you have some iterative solver and want to write out iterations, or it can be some step from a simulation standpoint. And we keep on expanding this. The other things that we try to do is be more topological aware, understand the topology of the system to get better performance. This was some of the results that we had to present. And for the one of our ECP review meetings and review meetings are always fun if you've ever gone through this. But one is that for um, one of the KPP ones led by Amitava um, from PPPL, one of the things that we had to do is we have to work 
to couple two codes together in memory. It's a mathematical strong coupling. They're two separate codes. In fact, what this will illustrate, it's kind of small, but there's two codes on the core, gene or gem. There's a code on the edge, XGC. And in fact, there could be other, other codes along with this. And we need to be able to couple these codes mathematically strong and really have low overhead. So one of the things we've done is the overhead is much less than 1% in this coupling. But the other thing is we wanted to reduce the overhead of writing some of the large um, PDF data, the probability distribution function. It's a particle and cell code. So we had to make sure that we can achieve at least a terabyte per second in writing. Similar for writing for E3SM, we're integrated you know, with their code base. And we had to make sure that we can get very high write performance and the current challenge that we've been really working on is a lot with the reading performance, especially as they move to these ultra high resolution cases that you'll see that you know, this becomes even more important. And the first challenge that was presented to us by the PI, Mark Taylor, was can you show us that we can get a gigabyte per second when we run for our IO? And luckily we've been able to go much further but we continue to make performance improvements. We're also part of another um, you know, KPP1 app, um, WarpX. We've done a lot of partnerships with them. And again, one of the things that we've had to do is make sure that you know, they use Amrex. They also use a IO abstraction that's on top of Adios and HDF5. And we had to show that, again, we can really reduce their IO. And um, I guess, some text is black, you can't read it, but basically the blue was adios of showing that we could get a terabyte per second for their IO compared to the old IO. And again, the contacts are listed for these. So adios has this technique called staging or in situ processing. So if you have your code and it works with adios, you can fairly easily change to now using streams. And we talk about doing this at scale or even from an experiment to an HPC device. When we originally thought of this, this was two professors, um, Carson Schwann, who was at Georgia Tech, um, unfortunately passed away, along with um, Professor Mish Parashar, who was at Rutgers, but now he's head of the Ski Institute um, at Utah. And we said, well, could we rethink of staging? And one of the first thing is, could we reduce the variability of IO by pushing all the IO to these other staging nodes, similar to what now people would say is burst buffers. Move the data there and then just stage it out asynchronous. That proved to be very complicated um, because you don't get that much bandwidth when you have a small amount of nodes that you have to write with. So it always became a challenge, whoops. But what we saw was that with staging, you can do other things. You can couple codes, or if you stage, you can do more analysis. And we started to re-envision this, kind of like a map reduce. Do some parallel part of your analysis where the simulation's running, but where you're gonna have communication, think of it as something asynchronous asynchronously move that data to these other nodes, and then do things like sort a particle array, plot, visualize data. There's all sorts of things we do, and we can really reduce the overhead when we do this. Nervo, again, will show this. And then as you further reimagine, you can start thinking about how you can take complex visualization codes, like this is, um, doing topological feature extraction. And you can really think of this partially on node, partially in these staging or analysis nodes to really reduce your overhead and your time to solution and provide, if you wanna say near real-time results. There's many other things that I, I don't wanna get into besides, this was going for what's being done in the WDM ECP app. Um, there's a, um, Part of the team is at RPI, 
they're coming up with a coupler. They're actually using a rendezvous algorithm in order to do the data movement. Adios is doing the data movement of where we are taking two codes. They both appear to be writing files. The mathematics of the coupling is running beside. And in the case of the WDM code, the important thing is there's one code that runs on the edge, XGC, and we don't want to slow it down. There's another code that's much, much cheaper than XGC, and that can wait around. So there's literally like a hundred to one difference from the amount of compute resources of these codes. So that what we're trying to do is make it so that the expensive code never waits. Um, we've been very successful. And to point this out, this was a slide. Um, it was a poor man's way of screen capturing Doug Posty in the kickoff meeting. We did highlight the work of this coupling with the WDM and you know code, you know, with the codes being done. In this case, he highlighted between Gene and XGC. And this is again important for the project. Well, the other thing is like what as we go further, and this was a fusion slide. One of the things that was interesting, and this is a partnership with CS Chang from Princeton, we started saying, well, now we can do things on the analysis node. Now we can stage. So as we start putting in these processes, all of a sudden we can have new physics discovered. And this was part of a highlight that CS Chang sent over to Fusion Energy. And the basic thing that he was talking about with these homoclinic tangles is that <clears throat> all of a sudden we can see these finger-like stru finger structures evolve here. And this has some scientific meaning. And again, what's great in ECP and the collaborations with applications is we create a technology, they start using it and not just because of us, but because they just started to integrate, now there's new physics discoveries. This is also from the Square Kilometer Ray Project. We work with the team that's in Perth, Australia. Um, in 2020, um, there was a Gordon Bell finalist. And basically, they're using Adios again to do a lot of their IO processing. This is important to us because when you have radio astronomy, you know, unlike a simulation, you can never regenerate the data. You capture it, you observe it, you capture it, you need to process it. They're talking about potentially a petabyte per second in raw. They get down to a terabyte per second, 24 seven though, this has to work. So we've been a partner. And what's really um, interesting is that they learned from Summit. This was again through their webpage at Perth. So I just took a screen capture of that. But now the system they purchased at Palsy is I would say a mini front tier system, an AMD system. So basically it's a very good partnership. Um, finally, um, one of the biggest data producers we face, and this is um, Norbert's done a lot of work with them. This is a highlight slide from your own Trump at Princeton University. And the main thing to get away is that they were producing 7.5 petabytes of data in a single workflow step. And they need to be able to fully process this a little later in another step. So they've been able to do this. And then what you can see is that when they have no IO, they take 94 seconds. And then this was with BP4, we've been able to reduce that to 156 seconds. And again, that's a paper by their team where they then include um, Norbert as well as um, some of the other scientists that come from Oak Ridge to help them make this you know, science discovery. Finally, I mentioned about in the wide area network as well, this was a different highlight from fusion where we have a, a real fusion reactor um, in Daejeon, Korea, it's called K-STAR. And what we wanted to be able to do is that we wanted to be able to take data from their fast camera. It's a megahertz camera, meaning a million seconds, a million frames a second. There's 11 of them. K 
Can we move that over, in this case, to NERSC? This was done on Cori. And can we use the Abbey abstraction to move it? And then we process this online on Cori. And what we were able to show is that from the way they were working, we were able to reduce their time for analysis from 12 hours to 10 minutes. And the hope is now as Perlmutter gets on, we can further reduce the time, which is almost exclu exclusively spent in analysis. We wanna go from 10 minutes to 10 seconds. And the reason why 10 seconds is significant is that the experiment eventually can go up to 100 seconds. Currently, they're 10 seconds. And, and 10 seconds again says that when the experiment or the shot finishes, we can then have all the data processed and then we can provide feedback for the next experiment. And eventually as the next generation fusion experiment called ITER comes online, which will last at least a hundred seconds, now you can really have feedback for some things, which again, have a several second latency. So, um, we are going for an R&D 100 award. Um, this is just showing some of the letters. I don't think this actually has all the letters, but you can see that we do work in an international community from Dresden in Germany, Tel Aviv, Israel, Tokyo, Japan, Perth, Australia. We have universities in this case. Um, we have Princeton, UMD, what's not sure is Irvine, company TAE, um, there's Sandia, Prince, there's Sandia, PPPL, um, other users at Oak Ridge, as well as LBNL and Los Alamos. So I, I'll also say a couple more words here. Even though we can do things fast, the whole thing is it's still not enough. So now can we compress or refactor the data? Um, I was part of the uh, organizer of an Oscar meeting that was not this past January, but the year before. We had a workshop, they had these priority research directions. And then what we saw was that, you know, we needed to provide the capability in Adios to use them. Um, our team works on a, it's a method based upon um, wavelets and, um, it, it's based upon wavelets and multigrid. And it basically, similar to Fourier, what you do is you decompose your data and then you can actually get different errors as you decompose such that you can now take your data and make, you know, get this hierarchy and know what error that you have. In other words, think of it as somewhat similar to an adaptive mesh refinement routine, if you're familiar. There are several steps to this. In this talk, I don't wanna to talk too much about it other than what Norbert will demonstrate is whether you're going through MGARD to compress for a lossy, or you go with ZFP, or you go with SZ, you don't change your code. And one of the things though that you have to be aware and what scares me, when you do these compressions, you do have to make sure that you have enough metadata, enough provenance so that 20 years later, even though Adios changes, even though the compressors change, we need a way to make sure people can still read the data. And that's one of the bigger challenges our community faces because for data and data to storage, people do wanna read the data 20 plus years later. I won't go more into MGARD if there's a strong mathematical theory other than there is a lot of work to get similar to adaptive mesh refinement to be able to get for regions of interest, lower errors that you can do well. We're working with many teams to do this. And I wanna finish by, um, actually, I don't know. Well, you guys, maybe you guys won't be able to hear the video. There was. There is no option. Could someone tell me if you can hear the video? We can't no. hear. Okay, so I'm gonna skip it then by just showing the slides. This is um, Professor Michael Bozeman, who's head of the Hemholtz Institute. Basically what they're trying to do is build these beam lines 
or tabletop lasers in order to target, um, if you want to say, cancer cells. So think of it as a less invasive technology. They simulate, they use a particle and cell code called PIC on GPU. As he illustrates, there's 10 trillion particles, 400 billion cells. In this run, he ran on 27,600 GPUs. What he'll tell you is that data is very important and we need to make sure that we can't store of it. So we need more in situ processing along the way. And they have come up with um, researchers at LVL for OpenPMD. And now when you put OpenPMD together with Adios, you can have more interactive, more in-memory analysis, and it will enable innovative simulation steering. And what they're pushing for is really going further to build a full digital twin. So um, I can't say everything as nicely as, as Michael, but basically they're going further of saying when you're actually including AI, you're creating AI surrogates to speed up your code, you're having AI for analysis, you have to be able to move data efficiently. And if you wanna say safely from all the different parts of the process to make all these couplings happen. And I'll, I'll go further. Um, just to the end where I like what he says, basically what he, he says is that, you know, he envisions a world of where we're moving much closer to these digital twins. They're gonna be all over in HPC. They need to work with HPC simulations which have AI surrogates for expensive parts of the code. You need to be able to inject this for real time interpolation of data. And we really want to have this inverse problem to be able to reduce on the fly, you know, analysis by orders of magnitude. So I'll end by just showing this is just what, so this is actually something that will be demonstrated to you, something very similar. And, and this is running and just showing some of the capabilities of Adios. Well, we're gonna run a code it's just a proxy because this was run off of a laptop, but it just says you could run multiple MPI jobs. This is where we're gonna run the main code. It's a um, reaction diffusion equation called Gray Scott. We're gonna run it. It's gonna generate files. There's gonna be windows to show analysis, plotting and visualization. So if I just play it, you'll see the simulation runs and then you could just start another um, another engine, you know, I, I mean, another calculation for computing the PDF. You can start your visualization codes to plot these. These are Python codes. And then you could start visit. And then you start visit. And what's happening is that you start and they just connect to the stream and they don't slow down the simulation. And now you can just use, in this case, full visit and just visualize. And if you want to stop, you can stop your visualization, rotate around. And again, the data keeps streaming. So now you can interactively do this. But the other thing that Norbert will demonstrate is that if you want, you can just quit out and you can quit out of these, but the simulation doesn't know. It's just doing what it's doing. And then you could read later, run these and then reattach to this. So again, the simulation just thinks it looks like it's writing files. It's just gonna think it's writing files, but when you could connect, now it connects using in-memory transfers. So there's actually no data produced in files in this, um, you know, in this demonstration. And that, you know, Norbert again, will show you this. So what I'll say is that, you know, in an overview, again, we are trying to make sure that in this data-driven error that IO can be done to extreme performance. And for our view, we really want applications to be able to write at least a terabyte per second on the current machines. We typically try to say, can we get about 50% of the performance 
for real codes as real codes will measure with and without IO and work with many different patterns. We're going to really go over the Adios APIs, show you actually how to do everything. Typically, if we had a longer in-person meeting, we would have this hands-on. We submitted a SC tutorial. If you happen to be an SC and if our tutorial is accepted, then it would be hands-on. We would have people helping to make sure that you can edit codes, you can modify to then perform you know, what we would show. So I'll say, I'm gonna stop sharing and say, are there any questions? And you can just unmute and ask a question as Norbert will start sharing his screen. All right, Norbert, um, can you take over? Yes. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, please ask your questions uh, during the tutorial. Um, Either in this chat or on the on the Q and A sections of the app, <clears throat> we will we will answer all those questions. <clears throat> I'm going to switch between uh, terminals and uh, presentation because I want to make this a little bit, yeah, do, doing demo instead of hands on, but show how things are working in Git Adios. Um, so in this tutorial. I, I built the latest Adios release 2.8 with the latest SC and ZFP compressors and uh, the latest HDFI 1.13 version to show you some features. Um, and the documentation I added here, all the links that you need to know about to getting the software or getting um, help or your report for you reporting issues to us, um, you, you can download from the, uh, but, um, the meeting page, the tutorial, and then you can use these links. Uh, these are the links that, to that video that uh, Scott just showed. And so let me start talking uh, about the audios approach. So first, what I just want to stress the basic concepts behind audios because it's not exactly the same as other IO solutions. So first of all, the, in the design, in the design of Adios, we focused on having a declarative API so that in the how you write your application code only focuses on declaring the data pieces that you want to, to output or input in an application. How the data is moved around whether it's stored on, on a storage or is it moved to another uh, uh, application or it's and, and what file format it, it's using, that's separated from the user code. You never, act, you never write code to optimize specifically for one or the other. And so this allows the users to choose a method that works on a specific system for their application. Don't need to start hacking around and modifying the code to make it work when they move to a new system or when the system is updated and something breaks. And for developers, this is a, a good framework because everyone has a, a, the same semantic view of the, of the API and then they create a new method for very specific applications or very specific uh, hardware um, solutions. And then so that the applications can just pick this up and, and don't need to um, modify their applications to apply a new method, a new engine coming out from the, for the Adios framework. So Adios provides a self-describing data uh, model, which basically consists of variables and attributes where variables are multidimensional type distributed arrays. 
and single values. Um, when you have single values, because we focus on parallel programs all the time, there is a global single value which one process outputs. It's really a single value in a data set that you create. A local value is one single value per process, like the rank of the, uh, an application that's stored in, in the data set and presented as a one dimensional array of values. So it just, it just for easiness, the basic is multi-dimensional typed arrays. And then attributes are static informations that you can assign to the global data set or assign to a variable. So when looking at the existing data set, um, a data set includes uh, a list of variables which has a type, which has a name. The name is just a string. The default delimiter is the slash, but it can be changed for, for different system or for application, whatever they want. It's really just a string. It, it um, mimics the hierarchical data storage. So you can organize the data as, as, a, as a, you, in, a, in a tree, but uh, these are just names. And then uh, you, with the audios BP format specifically, what you can also see is a global minimum and maximum value for that particular variable. So when you just list the content, you quickly can see the range of those uh, variables. So just uh, recapping the multi-dimensional uh, multi arrays. So the uh, n-dimensional array has a shape, uh, the global size that you have to declare. And then every process is going to place its own data into that global space. So for the every process has to declare a, a start and count for, for the dimension sizes. So basically the offset in the global space and the local size of the array. So usually what we do is have it, uh, putting the output of each process into a neat, tight, and dimensional array. But that's not, the, the API doesn't limit that. Uh, the global array shape definition is just, is just that, that's, it's a definition. So one can define a very large global array space and then every process can just write its own piece somewhere in that global space. So you can sparsely fill out a big space or you can overlap. Uh, logic, these are logical overlaps. Um, so every process is going to put its data out into this or into the stream. And on the reader side, readers can see a, a global array and they can read any portion of the global array and they will receive some data. So if multiple process overlaps data in the same space, then the readers will get one of those values and it's unspecified which one. If you have a sparse array where you don't fill out values in some areas, the reader will not get values there. It will, whatever it's in own allocated memory, it will be untouched. Uh, and of course, a process can output multiple blocks into the space in multiple put calls. So that's not limit, uh, limitation either. The other concept is the step, the audio step that Scott mentioned. And I want to emphasize how important this concept is for Adios. Um, in, in Adios 1, we, this was an add-on on originally trying to move from the storage I.O. into streaming I.O. And in Adios 2 design, the step concept is basically the one that unifies the API for storage data processing and streaming, uh, staging data processing. This allows us to implement features <clears throat> that works both for files and for staging. For example, I will show you how can run an application uh, producing the data while the consumer is running and reading back the data. And that can happen through files or through the staging. <clears throat> and it's basically also behind, uh, allows us to implement asynchronous IO <clears throat> efficiently for storage. 
I will show that too. So the what step means is that the application has variables and attributes, which, which in other libraries, you would write them and read them individually. In Adios, although you, you have calls individually for variables and attributes, but the input and output steps are happening in a step together. So either all the variables or none of them is still written. There is a, um, when it comes to the phase of doing the output, that's when all the variables will be output. And then, so then this is an audio step is not to be confused with application step, whatever step means as a time. This audio step is an IO step for organizing the output of data and the input of the data. And so we can have uh, uh, the producers are outputting data in steps. What the step contains is undefined and another step can contain other variables. So the simplest use case is that you have a set of variables and attributes that is created for an application. And then as the application iterates, it will just output new data on that same set of variables. So nothing changes in the schema of the, of the output step, but you are not limited in, in, any, any, in anything in these steps. You can remove all the variables and create new ones or change their uh, shapes and, and uh, they are, um, their composition across different processes and then write them. You can write a variable every other step or every 10 step. And then so what a step contains is, is independent from what other step contains. So the producer is producing steps. The, the data is not going through wide area network or the local network or to the disk variable by variable. It goes through step by step. And then the consumer gets access to whole steps. Once it gets an access to a step, then it can read any variables and attributes in that step. And, uh, and, and the semantics of Adios guarantees every engine must keep that data somewhere so that it can serve the consumer as long as it's the consumer needs that step. Once the consumer releases that step for, from reading, goes, moves, or releases that step, then the engines are free to free up and in staging uh, applications, the, the step disappears, all the data disappears. Um, and on a storage, it will be on storage, of course. And so this allows, this is the basic semantics in Adios that the data is output in steps, consumers get access to steps. And uh, when they have an access to a step, they, they can feel safe that they can read everything consistently until as long as they want, and then they release that step. Uh, but basically that this is summarizing the, the one that I uh, was saying. So, in, from the coding point of view, we have a few objects. Adios 2 is, is designed, uh, is, is implemented in C11. And so basically, it has C objects. And then on top of it, of the core framework, there are APIs. So there is a C11 API on top of the C framework. And also, there is a C API, a Fortran API on top of it. There is a Python API, a Julia API a MATLAB reader API and so on. So the objects are, one is the Adios object. This is basically used for the initialization and finalization of the Adios uh, framework. So that is just starting with it, it, hold, it holds every other object. Then there is a variable object for every single data variable that you define and an attribute for, for every single attribute that you define. The IO is a group object that holds all the variable and the attributes for a given that goes in a step to output and input. So for different IO purposes, like for checkpoint data, for risk um, analysis data, diagnostics data, one creates an IO group for each and then creates the variables and attributes under those IO groups. And then you know, open multiple output streams one for checkpoint, one from diagnosis, and then they will output those variables in, in, as an IO group. <clears throat> and then the engine object 
is the specific implementation of the output and input stream what is going to do something with the data. Um, and then we have another object, the operator object. This is assigned to variables to do something with the data before outputting it. And so we have the compress, uh, lossy and lossless compressors to um, and um, some encryption operators to, to uh, work on the data before it's written. So uh, how we use it, um, the first thing is to create the audios object. <coughs> the audios object has two inputs, both are optional. One is a config file. So for simple applications, the approach is, since audios is a framework and al allows you to, the user of an application to pick runtime options, like which engine to use, one to write to storage or one to write to staging, can be picked up by the user who is launching the code at runtime. So the config file is an XML or JSON file specifically for, for the Adios framework. And then it can contain these parameters and an MPI communicator naturally for an audio, uh, parallel applications, this, uh, one can pass the MPI communicator uh, Oh, sorry, sorry, William. Yeah, so not JSON, YAML. Okay, a YAML file. Uh, and then, so the MPI communicator, you can pass in the audios object, and then that MPI object can be, um, communicator can be used in the IO communicators, but uh, one can use different communicators in, in each IO object, so it's not necessary to pass MPI communicator here. And the config XML is not, also not, um, yeah, it doesn't take MPI info, sorry. Yeah, so, so in, in audios applications, the all MPI settings are usually in the environment of in, that users put in the bash script. There is no way to pass to audios MPI info objects. Um, I think the main reason is because Adios is not using MPI IO itself for IO. It's using MPI for communicating between processes, but it's using by default POSIX API calls in the to writing the data to disk. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the preferred way for a complex application, of course, is that application has their own system and way of supporting user parameters, right? So you don't just want to give a simple XML to a user say, hey, edit this if you want to choose your options. So that is of course an API for all the, the settings, the, the engines and the parameters for a run. And then you can incorporate that in your application. But for simple use, this is the way to do it. You just uh, give a, an external text file for us to control the application at runtime. Okay, so the IO object, uh, this is what holds all the variables and, and attributes. So you have to declare an IO object to create and you give a name. This name is only used to refer into that external config file. It's not used for other things. So you can look up an IO object deep in your code once it's, it's created. So that, that's the other usage of it. If you don't want to carry in a function arguments, you can just look it up by name. So this is just the, just the name for reference. And then to create a variable, now you have to use a type. Um, so variables have a, a, a type and then you define a variable and you give a name that name is what is it uh, in the output, how it looks like. So that can be a long string with slashes to mimic the hierarchical data storage or just a single letter, it doesn't matter to us. And then you specify global dimensions, then the start and the count for every process. So the, in this example, the GNDX, GNDY, 
parameters are should be the same value on every single process, while the offsets and the local sizes are dif different values on every single process so to place them in the naturally. Um, to write a, a checkpoint restart code, the easiest way is to just create you know, a number of process times n as a 2D array where n is the size of the array make it big enough and then you just do an offset with the uh, rank and zero and the local size is one by n and then you just dump the data and read it back easily but usually for analysis you want to uh, match your data to your application and one more thing that's a pecu peculiarity with adios is that when you run a c a c plus plus python code it shows the data in row major when you run Fortran, MATLAB, or R, it always shows data in column major. Some people hate it, some people love it. Um, it just is how it is. So if you have a Fortran application writing X, X, Y size, then that shows up in C as a Y by X um, array size. And then you can you can just read it as a row major data. Okay, so how do we write? To write, we have to create an engine by calling the IO open um, and give a, a string parameter, which is a name to identify a stream, which is for, for file engines means it will be the name of the file that it creates. Or actually BP is a, will be a directory which contains files. So checkpoint.bp will be the output data set in write mode. And then for every variable that we have, we just call a put and pass the variable object and pass the pointer to the data in memory. And then we call close. So the, the yellow warning is that the data semantically the, uh, in the put doesn't guarantee to in audios that anything happens to your data. Close guarantees that the data is going to be written to the disk if this is an, uh, an engine, or it will be completely buffered somewhere away from the, the user uh, memory uh, to, for output, uh, for staging later. So you should not use, modify the content of T, your, your data in memory until you close the file. This is very important, this is the main source of confusion and uh, bugs in running audio. So this is a serious warning that uh, it's always close or end step where you can start touching your data again. If, and, and I will show you the exceptions to that. So how do you read this back? It's the similar process. You create an IO object, then you call the IO open for identifying that uh, name of the stream and with read mode. And then now you get back the variable by inquiring the content of that IO object, um, which might fail. So variable has a, a, you know, can return false if it was actually not found, but if it was found, you can read it with get. Um, of course, you have to reserve memory for here for the T, T data to make sure that you can read back the data. And then um, in this syntax, the data will be in the T after the close. Uh, there are other calls you could do a sync mode to actually get the data now from the stream. And of course, if you do this in parallel, then there should be some call here to set uh, the memory, the selection in the global space, what you want to read in, because this example would just get the whole T in one process uh, because we didn't say otherwise. Okay, um, just, just to mention the, because how the BP it organizes the data is possible to write it to a distributed storage, like the SSDs in, the, in these supercomputers, every node has a SSD, then you can use that uh, pass to target the SSDs and processes 
who are aggregators in the output will write data to those local SSDs and all together they form a complete data set, but you cannot read it from the distributed storage directly because only can read the data which is locally available. The reader doesn't go out and start to get the data from other uh, remote disks. So after, after doing this, you have to dump it uh, to the file system to make it readable in general. But the, the point is that this is just a perk coming from the BP format, how it is organized in multiple files that the data can be located on different uh, storage uh, disks. Okay, so normally we want to make the data look nice because it's self-describing for humans. So we give a nice name like temperature to, um, to the variable as an output name, and we create attributes to describe something. So for example, temperature has usually a unit and we can create that string attribute and add it to the temperature variable. This is logically added. The point is that in the reader side, you can request attributes of the temperature variable and that will provide you the list of one attribute called unit. Okay, uh, right, so now we assume if we, if we output multiple steps, not just a single one, like in the checkpoint that we just create a file, you dump the data and then you close it and then done. Um, typic, the typical approach to IO is to do this for time step data too. So like someone writes diagnostics, Many applications I've seen that they just create a new file with the time step attached as a as a um, number to the file name. Okay, so engine support read write mixed uh, mode. No, it doesn't. Um, so for uh, you either write or read, and it's not allowed to this uh, the same process doing writing and reading back from the same file. Um, does the Adios work with Deos for Aurora? Yes. So, uh, the The current approach that we have is that we are replacing the POSIX calls with the DFS uh, Deos. Uh, functions that will create a uh, data set on the on, on DEOS that looks like a file. Uh, on, or other the future plan is to create another option to use the object storage API to create object store and then you, you, this whole file view disappears. But currently our approach is just to move Adios and all the engines that you can write data to disk they can just write, write data, data to Deos. Uh, yeah, read write mode, so that, that, that's not supported. Okay, so, so I was saying that uh, typically what I see with applications is to create multiple, one file per out, uh, time step that they output. For analysis, you just create a series of, of files and then you output it. And I will show later in this discussion of the performance, how to scale for large scale, these applications, I will show you that the number two issue is that, to rewrite, to create new data sets um, every step. And it's better to write just one data set and write all the steps into it, right? Uh, put it on the chat if you are scared about that, that uh, notion of writing multiple steps into a file because naturally you should be. So I'm waiting for your question about that. So now I need to explain the, the put a little bit. So, uh, okay, so I need to recap. So how to do that is that once you open the data set once, you create it in the beginning of the application and you close it at the end. And whenever you want to write a new step, you specifically say begin step. 
you call put for all the variables that you want to write, and then you call end step at the end. All the data will be out in end step. Oh, uh, yeah, Sean. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, so HDFI on Deus versus thing, we don't have any comparison, sorry. So I cannot tell you anything about it because I just don't have any comparison. Uh, okay, so um, you scared, thank you. Um, hey Norbert. Okay, so I let Scott answer just, HDFI just, versus Adios. Well, no, I mean, um, the the challenge um oh, okay so there have been plenty of comparisons with hdf5 and adios and again everything is depending upon probably who's writing the paper we work with applications so we would let the applications people speak to that because i mean i think again it really depends and and i was going to say on the deos part the problem is um, if you can give us a stable Deos installation that's that's on a system which is large enough, that would be great because that's been our frustration. All the Deo installations are small. So if anyone could offer advice on how to get a large installation right now, that would be fantastic. Um, if I may, this is Marta. I was uh, the person asking. Um, the reason that I ask is because of a particular application that is relatively small. So they currently have HDF5 as, uh, as being used for the main read and write uh, files. And I'm trying to understand um, how if this can be improved. I tested Deos on jealousy test beds. And I hope as soon as uh, anything is available on Aurora to, to test at the scale. So uh, eventually I, I, I could, uh, is possible to reach out to you to see if there is any benefit on using Adios potentially because of the size of the application it may, be, uh, it may not require too much effort to change. So I was thinking maybe it could, uh, it could be a good solution to try. So, 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 uh, so, so, I mean, it gets really difficult to answer because again, for some people it gets religious and, you know, you know, depending upon who you're talking to, it'll say better. M my view is that there is through the HDF vol layer, a way to write adios. Um, I believe someone on this call, um, Juming Gu from LBL, um, I believe she's on here, um, maybe not fully listening, but She's the one who implemented it. She's shown that we, from many of our codes, whether it's WarfX or if it's from some of the WVM codes or seismology, for all the codes, I mean, we've worked with everyone. And you know, you can imagine if if there's not, not an advantage for Adios, then Adios wouldn't exist because we're in this sense like the underdog. So there are a lot of apps um, all over the world that use it. They could probably tell you the performance, but depending upon your case, it may be that it's the same performance. So it really does depend. Thank you. Uh, first, I will try to get some real data uh, because of uh, the case that I have, it was just for testing. So I'm, I'm hoping to recover something that is bigger. And then as soon as it's available, some test bed in Aurora to move there and or also Polaris to get a, a better idea because this is a cosmology application and they have a huge, uh, huge files. So I'm sure that there is a way to uh, to improve. I tested also the HDF5 vol uh, Deus interface that is now on JLOC. Is, it was just again a test, um, but without changing anything in size. So in fact, one of my ideas is to, to see how we can, um, if there is any way to improve this HDF5 wall or to use it, if I'm not using it uh, at 100% that to use it better. So I potentially I can keep you positive if that is of your interest. Do you work, do you work with someone in particular at Argon? National mm -hmm. Laboratory? 
Th th there are, there's um, scientists we do talk to with Argon. Um, they're not currently part of the Adios project, though. But like you know, Rob for, Lassan, uh, maybe, or, or Kevin Harms? Um, for Deos, it's Kevin. For Deos, it's Kevin. Yes, um, yes, I'm in touch so, with Kevin. Mm. So, I mean, I mean, the Adios team has about 30 to 40 people on it. So there, there's plenty of people. I mean, if you have questions, we could certainly answer them for you. Um, and, you know, if, if your code, you know, if, if your code's using HDF5, you should be able to use the Adios Val layer to write and um, Jumin Gu, who's on this, um, I mean, I see her name in the participants, she might be able to help. That's J-U-N-M-I-N. She's the one who did this. So she might be able to help with that. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, let's go back to the steps here. Um, yeah, so the, the uh, maybe I'll, sh I'll show you the performance benefits of creating one, uh, data, uh, one data set and writing multiple steps in there. Okay, so the coming back to the put, what, all the example what I showed is that you you call all the puts here uh, for each variable and then you call an end step and then the uh, after end step you can start modifying whatever you have in memory in, in T but so these the begin step end step is considered as a sacred area for IO as the default use it use for it, but many applications create like just temporary variables just for the sake of output. Right? They have the data, some a large data set in, in memory is organized somehow, and then they create filter, pre-process, do whatever, create some variables that is really just for the purpose of later analysis. And that's what they do. And, and just create a placeholder, write that out, and then reuse the same memory to, to write it again, to write more data in there. So for, for the ease of use, there is an option to, to do that. An extra parameter saying, do this put now and give me, give me back access to the T, then you can modify it and then call a different a put for a different variable using the same pointer and then the data will be safe. So that's what the sync mode for put means the default is deferred, which is saying, I don't, I'm promising you, I'm not going to touch this pointer until you are done in the eye of it next step. Okay. The benefit, the potential benefit of using uh, deferred mode is that the B, the new BP engine, the BP5, doesn't buffer the data that you hand over these pointers. It's going to use those pointers in the IO. The sync mode makes it force BP5 to buffer it so that you can modify the, the, the original pointer so the memory usage increases. Um, that's the only uh, main benefit of, of separating uh, using deferred mode uh, as a default and, and specifically say you want a sync mode when you need it. Okay. Um, so how we use the HDF5 ng output with audios? Um, we have an engine called HDF5. Its purpose is to, to implement this API over an HDF5 storage. So it will create, if you use the, the, the naming convention, it will create a proper hierarchy in an HDF5 output file. And then you can read it back uh, later with an HDF5 engine, or you can read it back with an, an HDF5 tool. Okay, and so uh, the Python version is it? Uh, let me check again. Okay. Okay. So Python is obviously important that uh, most of the read happens in, in Python. So I'm focusing on showing that here. Um, we have a reader over NumPy arrays and, and supporting MPI. Uh, parallel Python to read. Um, first of all, I just want to, uh, this is a high level audios API, which is a simplification just for easy read, but the full audios C++ API is 
available through the Python interface too. So whatever you see in C++, you can use it in, in Python as well. But for the simpler use case, you just call open for opening a data set um, for reading uh, or writing. Yeah, so in this case, you open it for reading. Uh, optionally, you can pass the external config file and the name of the IO group that you want to use here. The purpose here for of this here is really to create a Python application that reads and writes data as part of a workflow of multiple applications written in Fortran, C++, Python, whatever, and you, you join them, the runtime parameters through this uh, single configuration file, uh, which I'm doing it in this demo. That's why uh, we have this API here. And the, or you can pass an MPI communicator as well if you do parallel Python reading, and then you close at the end. Um, you can get the list of variables as a dictionary, which includes so a dictionary by the name of the variable. And then it has the, uh, the app items are the type, the min max, if it's an array or a single value, a Boolean, a shape describing the global array and how many steps is available in this uh, input uh, file or stream. If you want to read it, you can read the uh, same other variable. So you can read the variable, entire variable, or you can do a sub selection of a portion of that uh, n dimensional array, or you can read multiple steps, even starting the steps from zero and then saying how many steps you want to read. So this, this will give you back uh, all the two steps from, from, uh, from the file. So all, all this is very simple, but the, the nicety of this high-level API is really this. This three lines, this two, this two line, this for loop reading, there is a for construct for the file that was opened, but the handle that opens file or stream. And then using this handle to read the variable, this for loop is going to work to read data step by step from a file or from a stream. So in the demo that I'm using, the Python script is basically this simple uh, for implementing reading a stream from an application. Okay, so for the, we have a Fortran API, but I'm not going to talk about this. So on the read the docs, which is basically the or main one to refer here to the read the docs. We have the audios documentation here, and you can see the full APIs of each language for Fortran bindings. Um, and then you can you can uh, go through here um, or the Python bindings for all the Python classes that, as I said, all the C++ functions are available in Python as well. And this is useful to look at um, when you look for a specific engine, what are supported, then you can go for looking for the options, the parameters, the runtime parameters that are available for that specific engine, like specifying how many aggregators to use, or um, if you want to uh, do asynchronous IO, there is a flag for that and so on. So I just wanted to refer to this. Uh, and so go there if you need more information. Okay, let me show the first part. So the, the hands-on is working with, the, with this Grace Scott uh, reaction diffusion system application. It's producing a 3D array, an N cube array that's divided, uh, decomposed uh, with the number of processes. And what we want to do is to run simulation, produce data, then analyze that data, produce additional uh, derived data, which here is doing a PDF on every single 2D slice of the 3D array, create a histogram, and then plot that histogram for, for uh, well, the simple case, just the, midi, the middle one, uh, the slice in the middle, or any, any number of slices um, and create this plot. So this is what we are going to do here. And I'm going to focus first 
on the file-based I.O. Now I'm going to bring the screen down here. So I should have cleaned the screen first. So you don't, don't get confused. Can you see well the text or should I increase the font size? So uh, we don't have any data files yet, right? Okay. So let me run this ex uh, example. Um, so I'm going to run just on four process. Uh, the gray Scott example, and it has a settings uh, for files. Yeah, I should start with how, what I'm going to run. So the set setup is that I'm going to run uh, a thousand time step it, uh, iterations, thousand iterations in this application, and we'll output every 10 step. So we'll have 100 output steps in the output called gs.bp. Um, and that, that's all that you need to know. So the application is using the BP5 engine right now. That's what's set up uh, using the audios to XML for input and gsbp for the output file. And it's been uh, simulated 1,000 steps and wrote 100 steps. So our output is a 400 megabyte file here, so 40 megabyte every step uh, written. If I want to list it, what I can see is I have 100 steps of a 64 cube variable, double variable called u, and the global uh, mean max is close to zero to one. And uh, similar, I have a variable v, and I have a step variable, which was a scalar every step 100 times running from 10 to 1000. Right, so, the BP4 and BP5 engines that were developed in the, in the ECP program are, is a directory. So the structure of a, a BP5 directory is, there are some data files, uh, one or many. There is a metadata index. This is the, so this is the many, yeah, there is no single file option. So it's always a directory. Uh, there is an index file, and then there is two levels of metadata file for BP5. There is MD0 and MD0. There is one level of metadata for BP4, which is an older format. And depending on how many aggregators we have in an application, we have one or many data files. So now that we are here, let me show you the runtime options. So we are using the simulation output in these as the IO group name. And so the setup, the, the parameters for in this group is going to be used for uh, what for the output of the engine. So we are using BP5 engine parameters and we said the number of aggregators is one. If I change this to two, we run the application on four processes. What's happening is two of them is elected as aggregators. They gather data from the other processes and they going to write data separately. So now we have two data files in this directory. Yeah, so there is no such thing for BP as a single file uh, because we are targeting the, <clears throat> the large scalability uh, for IO. And uh, in a large parallel file system, it's not possible to utilize the bandwidth of the file system with a single file. 
you have to create multiple files to to increase the the usage so as we implemented it is not it's the index the metadata is always separate from the data files and then we have an index to that we start as a top level to find the steps okay um what other op options we have here um uh, okay let's not focus on options right now so can you be used tools there is uh, <clears throat> of course there is no difference between how many data files we have we always see <clears throat> the <clears throat> the global data set and then we can we can get more information about that uh, uh, variable so what we can see on the u variable is that there are a hundred steps starting from zero and in every step there are four output blocks we had four processes writing each one writing one block per process and their uh, position in the global space is is basically a 2d decomposition uh, 64 by 32 by 32 intentionally just doing it the wrong way um, to decompose you know in a wrong dimension uh, so because this means we have in the fastest dimension we have two separate processes have the data somewhere on disk to 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 put it together but for, as a user you don't need to really care about it as uh, as long as you can read the whole thing right if i want to print yeah let uh, a data piece of data from this variable u i want to, to read step 99 from the offset 20 20 20 just read a four by two by three block and print out the six values of that last two dimension in one line for pretty printed and now you can see the values in the particular space i don't want to print the 64 cube because that would be too big here Um, right. So if we want to change, how do we change an engine? Um, we basically change the name, what engine we want to run and choose HDF5 engine and don't want to confuse anyone. So we changed the output file name to H5. So now if I run the same application, it's uh, using the HDF5 engine. And now it produced the H5 file, as you can see. This is a single file. So maybe that's the answer. Single file option is the HDF5 engine. <clears throat> if I run BPLS on the same thing, oh, yeah, the same thing of course as the BP5, BP5, I read the H5 file. Um, yeah, it, it's just the same, it behaves for us the same thing. The value is a little bit different because, you know, it's mostly the same. There is a little difference. And that's just because of our application has a noise added. So that intentionally there, there is a little noise added in the simulation. So uh, the values are slowly changing randomly in, in the data. Um, if I turn that off, you would see it exactly the same. Can you read the, the five a day? Yes, you can. So how the, the file looks like. This is, this is a, how we represent the HDF file. Every step is created a, as a one, a new, a new, new branch in the tree. And then for a given step, we have, we add the variables as the, uh, HDF5 data sets, right? 64 cube data sets. And the reason why we don't go with another option like creating um, uh, unlimited dimension and extending it because first of all, uh, well, because we 
don't require to have the same size for the U uh, <clears throat> data set on every step. And a different application can change the size of a, <clears throat> an array every single step. Particle simulations particularly do this because particles disappear and, and uh, new ones create spawn. And so the, the total array size changes. And so that's why we, we are forced to, in general, just to create a new branch in the tree, right? So then, so HDF5 can read this data. And so any, any HDF5 tool you have, including HDF5 Python tools, then you can read the data. Okay, let's go on doing analysis. So let's go back to let's set it up back to let's reset the whole thing. So I don't have anything, uh, and I just reset everything to the original. Move back to audios here and run, produce the data first. So we have the data. Let's run the analysis code. In the, so this will slice, three process will run, they slice the, the cube into 2D slices and they will produce a, an other file. And since it's useful, we need a number of bins. What we got here is another file. So in this case, we have uh, the description of bins and the PDFs, uh, which is now 64 by 100 to the array because we have six, original array was 64 cube, we have 64 slices and we have 100 bins. So this is a histogram that we can plot. And just for, uh, yeah, so the, the cool stuff, one, one cool stuff about the, uh, the, the BP format, Let's me clean up this data so we don't have any data. Let's run them together. So what's happening here, um, the simulation is running, the Grayscott is running, producing data and writing the data step-by-step step into one output file, the BP5 file or directory. And then the analysis code is running, it's behind the simulation and it's reading the steps one by one and then producing the data. So we have both files there. And then produce the 100 steps. So what you've seen right now was basically staging through the storage. One application was writing the data step by step and the reader was reading step by step and they didn't inter interfere with each other uh, because the, the grace cut was outputting newer steps that was while it, the, while the IO was happening, while the writing was happening, the reader consumer had no idea because it didn't see that entire step. It just didn't exist, ex, existed for the consumers while the writer was working on it. Once the writer was completely done, and the step appeared in the index, then the consumer had a chance to discover it and give it to the, you know, uh, give it available to the consumer and the consumer could read it. And vice versa, the consumer was just reading from a file different steps, the metadata and ev uh, everything related to a given step is completely independent from newer steps. So it was safely doing whatever it wanted to read see the entire history of many steps 
while the, the writer could append new steps to that uh, data set. So I think it's a cool feature. Um, you can say in the chat, blah, or anything, what you want about it. Okay, so let's just block them. Um, so we have some Python scripts. Um, and of course it has some code to do stuff, but what basically the structure is, uh, where is it starting? Yeah, it was here. So we are opening, we are opening this stream uh, in parallel or serial, whichever. And then we have a loop, a for loop. And in this for loop, what we basically do, we yeah, get this, which step we are in, and then we get the list of variables. We discover those, and we, um, we will create new ones for the PDF and bin wars. Oh, so, no, sorry, it's looking for uh, u slash and v slash pdf and bins and then it will want it will discover the shape of those arrays will do a decomposition of across the parallel processes so this is nothing to do with others it's just there's a parallel application trying to decompose what the data they want to read and then they read it right so this is where they read in the pdf and the bin for for that step in that uh, the slices that it wants to do uh, it also reads in the step scalar, right? So that's all you want to see for audio. So you have a for loop. There is some discovery, these ones and the shape. And then here are the actual read functions. And then we go plotting. And then, yeah, there is nothing else. That's the for loop. Uh, and then we, we close at the end when the for loop ends. So the for loop will end in a case of BP5 file, when we run out of the steps. Um, uh, not when the application starts, but when actually the producer stops because there is a flag in the BP5 index saying this is still being constructed by an application. So the, re the consumer doesn't prematurely quit. So that was one point of action. So this was a very important effort in the ECP program to develop audios to both at the API level and the engine level to, to provide the same functionality as much as possible through storage and through staging so that really an application doesn't need to change its source code to move from one engine to the other. So as you could see, we could even do this, um, my colleagues are testing the WDM app code coupling through files just for debugging purposes. And then they just unleash it with the, the staging engine to run it in, in production and it works. So this was an important topic that I wanted to, to show you. Um, now it's time for to talking, uh, so please write your questions if you have, and then I'm going back to presentation. I'll talk a little bit about, okay, how to do, do this on lots of nodes, not just on my single laptop. So there are only a few options to tinker with the performance of an Adios application. So what, uh, what this application does at small scale is does the same way on large scale. And the, the main reason is behind how we organize these steps. So the application works in a IO steps, and then we have full information about what is the data that we have to output in a given step. Um, all the variables, the data sizes, uh, we have all the pointers, and then we can do the IO. For the for the given output uh, hardware, and uh, the main choice is picking the number of files that those data files that we tailor to the file system capability. So, doesn't matter how many application processes we have. What matters is that the number of files is tailored to the capability of the file system. So like the number of OSTs in a Luster file system. 
number of servers in, in the what, whatever the um, GPFS servers can handle. The second step, second level of optimization is to append multiple steps into a single output file. And I will show you why that really matters with Adios. And then there are now a new option to turn on asynchronous write with the BP5 engine, but um, the first two already provides, you know, the Scott showed the slide on the SpecFam 3D globe seismology workflow is producing a, a petabyte every 15 minutes on summit and writes it. And, and it also reads it in a different workflow step. So it's hard to argue what, you know, what else you need for storage. Um, beyond that, we need to move into staging if you if you still need more bandwidth. And that's I'm going to show you how the Picon GPU folks uh, did that for themselves. Okay, so the first option is, since the, the one thing is a single file cannot utilize the entire bandwidth of a parallel file system. The parallel file system is not designed that way, that it is designed to handle lots of files, not a single file with the top performance. And uh, when we have many writers into a single file anyway, the bottlenecks of stepping on, on their toes, each other's toes increases with the number of writers. So eventually many writers writing to a single file will cause a bottleneck and that will slow down the entire IO process. Basically the writing just tanks, the writing performance tanks. So one file per, one file for the entire application is not a good choice. The one file per process is the best choice as long as you are at small scale, as long as you don't choke the metadata server or the, or the file system server. So uh, on Summit, this number is around the 3000. So we can easily create 3000 files from the 3000 processes. It can handle it, but then beyond that, it starts slowing down and 6000, your application will suffer. So choosing one file per process is good for I would say medium applications, but this is the ECP meeting. If we talk about exascale computers, we talk about thousands to 10,000 nodes and tens of thousand uh, processes writing. So you don't want to do that, right? So the good solution is to create K subfiles somewhere in between. And this is, um, you pick this value knowing what system you are running. Uh, right, so on Corey, uh, you have, uh, I don't know that exists, 240, 256, something like that number of OSTs. Uh, they are good OSTs, they can handle like three or four files, each of them. So you can scale your IO to a thousand sub files. But you know, it's a KNL, you have lots of processes running on each KNL node, so you, you, you can have many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of writers, you don't want to create that many files. A thousand file is a good choice on Cori. On Summit, this is today around 3000. Uh, you can, so basically the audio's default value for BP engine is one file per node. So as long as you're running on a thousand, 2000 nodes, it will just write 1000, 2000 files and everything will be okay. But you can tailor it by saying how many aggregators you actually want. You can specify the exact value, how many aggregators you want across the, uh, the processes. And each one of them is going to write a separate data file into the disk. So that's what new aggregators is basically the number of files that we are writing here. Or you can just choose an aggregation ratio, which is a generic number like on summit six to one, that means applications that running on GPU, one MPI task per GPU, you have six MPI tasks per node, it will be one file per node. So you can just set it and it doesn't matter how many nodes you run, you will get uh, one file per node. Um, <clears throat> this is a good setting for large scale, but if you're running on 128 nodes, 256 nodes, actually the obvious application is not using the full uh, potential of the file system because it's not writing enough files. 
So it will be spending more time aggregating across processes, writing a few files, than writing more files. Uh, it's up to you. You want to do this? We just have these uh, the default, which which works great until many uh, thousands of nodes. So why this is important, I want to show is that um, uh, Scott already called out Jumin. Uh, she did a test with the VPKIO tests back in the, uh, a couple of years ago to show um, as the running 42 process per node. So this is a, a, not a GPU code here, but it, uh, the, as IO test, it's just running 42 process one per C, uh, CPU core. Uh, and then writing data. And if we choose um, one file per process, the, uh, the light blue, 42 writers per node, that gives us the best performance on, a, on uh, 42 nodes. So that's the process is uh, you know, um, 42 by 42, uh, 1700 files. But that, uh, and even at 84 nodes, 3,500 files is still the best. But then it quickly tanks as we scale up double the number of nodes, right? And then it's, it, the next option becomes the two, uh, every two writer writing one file will be the best at uh, 168, but then it tanks and so on. If we aggregate more and more, we get more scalability. And the default one choice the dark blue one is obviously not the best choice for at this scale for this application because it's it's underperforming, but it is going to scale nicely up to for, uh, thousands of nodes. So um, if you run at smaller scale, you can choose a, a more a less aggressive aggregation than the default one writer per node. So this is what the the, these applications that we showed in the opening slides are using is to, uh, they are all GPU codes. So they have like up to six MPI tasks and they aggregate like uh, either one file per node or two files per node. Um, and it is GTC application on 512 nodes pick you, you try to maximize the IO performance with 3000 subfiles. So every process is writing. Okay, so this, this is the, the number one reason uh, why Adios has performed well more than 10 years ago. This is what the Adios one software design brought, the, the file format design and the implementation brought is to store the data in subfiles and store uh, and then utilize the bandwidth uh, of the file system. So that's why we had great success in the petascale era before ECP started. Now, when we start with the application running, you know, you know they, they love this performance, in, uh, this performance of getting terabytes a second. And they, okay, but they want to use that bandwidth, write out all that, write even more data because now you have not limited really by IO um, to a certain extent that you can all put orders of magnitudes than before you did having audios in the code. So the appetite grows and you write more data. So what we found is the second bottleneck using audio, when you use audios application now uh, with setting the subfiles properly is that if we start to create a new data set every step when we output, then we pay a high cost of creating those directories and subfiles on, on, the, on the storage, right? So the more the large, more large scale we create data sets, the simply the open has a cost. And it can be very substantial on it. This is an XGC uh test run here and it's not writing much it's just writing 40 gigabyte every step writing a 100 step quickly so it's four terabyte data it's very small for a thousand node data uh, uh, a thousand node run 
but so if we create this every every step we create the data the total cost increases exponentially so if you want this doesn't bother everyone you know in their medium medium scale run but when they scale it up to large scale thousands of nodes it actually becomes a big problem um unless you have a bigger problem you know that hides this problem if you uh, <clears throat> have an inefficient io like picking the wrong sub number of files then you, you know you can spend thousands of seconds in io and you don't recognize that opening is an issue but after this opening is an issue so the xgc behaves like this so what when we work with gtc um similar a, a fusion application it had its own text uh, POSIX binary data and netcdf data and how they organized the data was the snapshot is the basically their their basic analysis data that write every single step so in a 10,000 out uh, iteration they write 1000 file and if they and then the three dimensional data uh, use netcd parallel netcdf to store the data uh, in um, in parallel and they create um, um, every toroid or roots I think one uh, 10 or 30, 32 uh, I'm sorry the application is it has uh, partitioned into 32 so-called toroidal planes in the in the tokamak and uh, they pro, pro create 32 files for each each and then write out uh, 1000 steps so you end up 32,000 data sets written to the disk each one is written with parallel CDF. And then the checkpoint is every, they just use POSIX IO, every process just dumps its own data. So you have, and they do a black and white pattern of writing one file, uh, alternating one checkpoint and then a, a, another, and a, another checkpoint. So with, with Adios, what we did is to optimize these, put the snapshot into a single, single audios uh, output stream so we have one file instead of ten thousand to put the output data into a single data set so instead of having thirty two thousand data sets we have one data set but since it's every process is writing three thousand ranks it's aggregated to 512 one file per node and similarly the checkpoint is writing everyone is writing it into one data set appending but we have 512 subfiles so the number of files is 1000 uh, you know 1500 versus uh, um, almost 50000 files and uh, the difference is is very very big right so in this run um, so the story behind is G this is gtc execution after uh, years of optimizing gp uh, for gpu uh, at, uh, in ECP and uh, in other uh, projects for, for moving to the GPU calculations. So they do that more than 10x or 20x uh, improvement. So then the IO became the largest bottleneck running on Summit. It wasn't before, but now it's a bottleneck. But moving into Adios, changing everything into Adios and basically decreasing the number of files created over the lifetime of the process the improvement is, you know, 12,000 seconds down to 600 seconds. We are not happy with the 600 because that's still uh, is not fantastic, but it's much better than when creating and waiting for files being created in the parallel file system. So just pointing out that snapshot, the cost of creating of each one was a quarter of seconds overall. But having a single output stream, this was this disappeared. Of course, one could do this with the same the POSIX one, and you just write your workflows with POSIX. So that's not adios magic. This is just moving from many files to a single file. Okay, and uh, so just the same thing happened with Warpex. Uh, working with them, uh, the first moving from the Amrex has a pretty good. Uh, IO solution, the plot file, which is doing subfiles. So the number one bottleneck was uh, is already considered there. So it was competing when we started to use BP 
output for Warpex. Uh, it, it didn't show uh, you know, a clear win. Why would you use Adios for outputting the data? But then when we moved into writing one data set and outputting multiple steps together, then we removed the second bottleneck and now we got closer to, and then we reached a terabyte lately, uh, doing uh, one file per node, appending all the steps into one data set. Uh, this, was, this is a 1000 node. Uh, run. This is what then 2000 run node we are over a terabyte a second. Right? So these are the two important things to keep in mind. Choose your number of files and output a single stream, multiple steps into an output file if you can. Since you can access the data with BP, uh, <clears throat> during the run, you are not losing out. So if you want to do your analysis while your, your lay-long simulation is running, you can, you can read your data, as I showed you already in the, in the demo. And the other thing is the metadata and the data is completely separated for the steps. So there is no way to corrupt in the file existing steps. Right? So everything is a log-based format. Everything is appending to the file, adding, never going back in a previous offset. So you cannot, and uh, the, the producer cannot go back and do anything with existing steps. It's just adding to it. So that provides us the safety that you cannot corrupt the BP format file just by appending new, new steps there. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm not talking about this, this is not, Basically, ECP just don't do uh, single process writing all the I.O. Um, OK, so the third option, this is becoming, uh, this became available now with the latest release, with the latest form, format and engine we have, which called BP5. Uh, the BP5 separated um, these steps completely, and, and it uh, uses uh, shared memory in, in the node to do aggregation and doesn't use MPI to send data between the processes for the aggregation purposes as we did before, which doesn't make much change in uh, the performance or actually that, so it doesn't improve performance. That was not the point. The point was to decrease the memory usage and as a benefit, it gave us the option to do the aggregation while the application is doing the computation and we are not using MPI for the asynchronous part of data writing. So we don't, we have an asynchronous data writing option, which is, doesn't require multi-threaded MPI. It's not using MPI, but it's using an extra thread. So the the processes that are running launching a thread to do the data writing in the background while the application is running. Um, the improvement, be, uh, so the metadata gathering is in Adios is still happening in the end step call or the close call. It's not going to happen in the background. So the asynchronous IO is not completely hidden you know, the computation cannot hide the entire output step. We still spend most, uh, a lot of time gathering all the metadata from every process and writing those metadata and metadata index files. So that's up, upfront cost. And then in the background, the data can be written uh, to the disk. And we don't have too much experience with this yet. So I, I don't really have a good guidance when it's going to help. An example here is a Vorpex run on 512 nodes, 3000 GPUs in writing 3000 files. So there is no aggregation here. And the main, it's a multiple story here. So the BP3, one file per step, this is the old audios one approach, has large IO overhead. And when we start appending into a single file, it drops a lot. So this is where the big game comes. And then 
In this case, BP5 works similarly to BP4. Uh, that's not always the case. It can behave worse. So BP4, BP4 is really stellar, giving the stellar performance with the cost of high memory usage. BP5 is using less memory, but it uh, and it's moving away from using MPI for the aggregation step. But otherwise, uh, it, it can have more cost with, uh, associated with that. And then turning on asynchronous IO in this case uh, improves, you know, half of the cost disappears just because doing it in the background. Um, what we implemented is to, to create two separate uh, strategies. One is the naive implementation. So we have, we launch a thread. And so the top line is the application doing its own thing after calling end step, it does, whatever it does, communicates, computes, communicates, computes, whatever it does, until the next begin step. Since we have a, yeah, so the naive implementation just launches a thread and does the writing in the background, ignorant of what the application does, doesn't care about it, finishes when it finishes. So it hopefully finishes before begin step, or if it goes beyond and finishes later, then the uh, application is going to be blocked in the next big step core. But since we have the step concept, uh, and so we have the application, so we can learn from the application the length of the, the gap between steps, and we can that way, that way predict the next step and use that as the timing of saying, okay, how much time we have to do this in asynchronously. And then we have one specific, uh, not automated, but guided implementation. There are two extra functions in the Audios API and application can declare uh, phases in the computation where it's not doing uh, communication. So I say, I'm entering a computation block, I'm busy, I'm not going to use the network, you can use the network. Um, and in these sections then, uh, the guided mode is going to do the IO and when it's over, when you exit the computation block, then it will stop doing IO so that doesn't introduce that much interference to the application. So that's the idea behind it to do uh, avoid the communication heavy phases of the application not to, to, to reduce the interference between them. So the, there could be other implementations for research purposes or, or whenever we get a better idea, we can do even better. But right now, these, these are the two that we have and we really don't have much uh, experience with this. Um, I did run XGC at you know small scale 128 nodes um, and uh, the IO to begin with, it was not very costly. It's a 1.2% uh, IO overhead of uh, doing the IO. And when we use both versions, the guided and the naive version, they produce the same speed, decrease the IO overhead a little bit. I would say in general, this is the one, but no one cares to improve this much anymore because you just want to focus on other things. So once we someone solves the first two problems and you can produce and consume petabytes of data, I'm not sure if you need to bother with that much. But, but some applications are bottlenecked with the storage performance, even on Summit, which has over two terabytes a second bandwidth. Uh, the one example is peak on GPU and I'm using front specials um, slides from last year's Smoky Mountain conference. And where the vision is to run peak on GPU in a in-situ pipeline instead of what? Well, so the standard is to run peak on GPU simulation at very large rate, produce many petabytes of data and then run post-mortem, uh, reduce the data, analyze it, plot it, whatever. Right, so the vision is to, but it can actually produce a lot of data very fast that even two terabyte a second storage cannot absorb. And so still the IO is the bottleneck for very data intensive uh, application here. So they want to do the reduction on the, and the analysis in the online while uh, 
writing the data, the reduced data into the storage. So there are two parts of this study, uh, but so I have to shout out for, for open PMD, which is a data format, a self-describing self data format for particle mesh data. So if you actually write particles and fields on meshes, you just look it up and look if it works for you. Um, it, it's an application-oriented data format. Uh, HDF5 Audios is, is a general data format, but if an application wants to give more semantics, uh, more tools for their application data, then this is the best way to go to develop a new, uh, um, more specialized format and then implement on top of multiple IO libraries so that you can use any of them, whichever works for you at a, whichever scale or whichever system. So OpenPMD works with both Adios and HDF5. So anyway, so the first thing is to study if they can stage the data from the application using a second application and, and write it to the disk and how that behaves. So this is basically asynchronous IO implementation by having a second application the data stage to the second application and the second application has the data and writes to the disk uh, while the application continues to work. Um, so in the in their test, uh, what they found, um, this is a log scale um, uh, chart in gigabyte per second. This line is the GPFS bandwidth limit is around two and a half terabyte a second. And uh, when they are writing files, this is a green one, it gets close to two terabyte and sometimes below in multiple runs, um, but it doesn't even reach that. Um, if they run the second application and stage the data from Picon GPU to this uh, um, async writer and then write to the file system, or what the application experiences is uh, bandwidth faster, higher than the, the GPFS performance. So the data is moved from PICON GPU to the second application faster than possible to GPFS. But then of course, the second application is limited and cannot go over the file system limit. So as long as the application produces data in bursts, it can pass that on on a second application and then that will be limited still to two, two and a half terabyte a second. Uh, and then the application is not bottlenecked. But of course, if this is doing 24 seven all the time, then of course it's going to be limited down to the, this bandwidth limit. So the main application of, of this staging is to, you know, what they do is to run pick on GPU, write to the storage, and and then lead back by, for the analysis, which is going to do whatever it does, uh, doing the analysis and reducing the data, and then just writes uh, you know, orders of magnitude less data as an output. So if a simulation, if they don't need this complete data set, they're just interested in producing the analyzed data set, they can run these through uh, staging. If they run through storage, they are limited to the, the total bandwidth of the file system. But if they do uh, staging, then what they get is they can elevate to a higher level of um, <clears throat> bandwidth. So using the SST engine, this is the sustainable staging transport in, in Audios, and connecting the two applications <clears throat> together uh, and running them together on the uh, same set of 512 nodes. Uh, PICON GPU is a very big uh, GPU heavy code and then the, the other code can use the CPU cores to analyze the data. So they run together. And then uh, depending on how they do this, they can be performing much worse or much better than the entire file system. So, SSD can use either TCP or can use RDMA uh, for uh, doing the staging. And RDMA, of course, works better in this case uh, because it avoids 
the, the back and forth communication between consumers and producers using direct memory access and the consumers can pull out the data from the producers. So they get from the dash line up to the solid line in both case, uh, cases. And the other one is how the data is shared. So we have two applications running co-located on the same number of nodes. So if they every reader reads data from the processes on that node, you get naturally much better bandwidth than if you are reading across nodes. So randomly, when you just run two applications, they read with the, read with a different decomposition of a global array, then you will have communication crisscross across the nodes. But if you take care of it that you only require request data that is actually available on that node, uh, then you get much better bandwidth. So no magic here. So these are the options and what they could achieve if doing local streaming. So keeping the read pattern, not just in, within one node, but the close by nodes and not trying to get data from remote nodes then uh, and using RDMA, then they could uh, go over the GPFS um, bandwidth uh, on 256 nodes and then even more on five terminals. This is around four terabytes a second. And uh, lately they run on a thousand and we went up to it, eight terabytes a second processing. So they could process much more data using staging than with through the GPFS. And that's basically after going through the, the number of aggregators and writing data into single steps, and you are hitting the file system limits, then the next option is to go into staging. Okay, the use, the, another use case for this staging is, is what we've seen with multiple applications now. Applications tend to add new codes over, over time for analyzing more data, right? Do we make, oh, want a new science, add these more, more calculations and then produce a new data set. It happened to the XGC2 one, time, one day, not one day, so uh, in a project, they wanted to add tracer particle analysis into the code. It works fantastically, it produces new science, but it's a communication heavy, not well scaling code, and it's becoming the bottleneck when it, you run it in the XGC code, right? In the thousand nodes run in, in particular uh, simulation, it became like one third of the execution time is just doing these extra new add-on thing in the application. In this case, but in such cases, it could be a good idea to move this code out of the main application and run it in situ on separate set of nodes, or if you can co-locate it, uh, sharing the you know, one runs on GPUs, the other on C CPUs or different sets of CPUs. But anyway, run it in C2 and run it uh, in, in concurrently with the application. As long as you can keep the, the communication cost, moving all the data from the application to this separate in situ analysis code plus the execution time of the analysis code below the execution time of the simulation, then it, you know, it's completely, it's a complete win. You, you just hide the cost entirely instead of, um, I mean, of course, the, in the total cost calculation, you have extra nodes used for this, uh, this simulation. So XGC was lucky because they could run the analysis in, on four nodes at, uh, at the same time as on a thousand nodes. And so there was some data, a move, a data movement time was not too much because this was like a 95 gigabyte every step. Oh, yeah, 96. So it's not a big data set moved between the application and the analysis code. So it was really negligible. And then the, the analysis just could run and produce all the data with a tiny cost, four nodes, this was 0.4%, right? So this is a good application use case for moving from storage-based IO into staging IO to even improve the, the, uh, the throughput of the application. Okay, so that's end of my 
presentation about how to scale up, and then I will just go into more <clears throat> more uh, demonstrations. So please uh, tell me your questions. I cannot see the chat right now, so I don't know. So no one has any questions? Um, I have a question. Yes. Can I ask verbally? Uh, hi, Norbert. Um, there, there are so many, it seems like there's many different ways uh, to run RDOs. Um, and I'm wondering for the end user who doesn't necessarily want to understand it, they just want to use it. Has anybody tried to like parameterize all the different options and then kind of do a, like a black box optimization of, uh, you know, run 10 different versions of the code with different RDOs options and find which one is the quickest and just not worry about why it's the, why it's the quickest and use that? Uh, well, yeah, so over the years, there have been research projects trying to set up testing frameworks and learning to try to autom automate um, do an automatic way of suggesting the best values for an application. And uh, as far as I know, there are no uh, good results. So we don't have any automated way to tell you what is the good result, good setup. So the audio's default setup is like in a storage is that we write one file per node is really just you know a hunch from experience that that's a good setup for for the DOE petascale and exascale computers that has very heavy nodes and so have thousands of nodes and the file system is scaled to handle thousands of files. It's it's not a good setup for uh, uh, Fugaku, for example, which has tens of thousands of nodes. Um, and it's not good setup for if someone running medium scale runs. Uh, uh, what I'm hoping for is that it's good enough as long as you don't hit the problem. Uh, you just use Adios and then that's, that basic setup for the IO should give you a, a, um, a, a good performance. But of course, if you need more and you find that IO is still the bottleneck, then you, you need to investigate, right? You need to ask questions from us telling, okay, this is what I experience. How can I improve it? Really, um, I really don't have any, from, from experience, I don't have any better solutions than that. You use it, it should give you a, you know, yeah, it, it should give you a good performance. If it's out of the box giving you bad performance, then, then that's usually some bug or misunderstanding how to use it, um, which, that we can clarify by discussing how you use Adios. And then um, later, if it's, it's everything is working all right, but not fast enough, then, then we can investigate, okay, what is, uh, what is the problem? There is not much to do in the source code. Uh, for BP5, there is some, it's on the read the docs, is basically how, how much memory you want to save compared to, to performance. There is some thing there, but it's not, it's not really much. Uh, you don't change around the, the how you, well, might be if you if you are just totally doing some crazy things crazy things in mean crazy is that i think that is crazy not you think is crazy and i'm saying okay this is not going to work with audios then you have two options either to leave audios because saying that's that's crazy or work together to fix it uh, to do it properly but i'm just babbling here because that's not really happening with with the with the applications okay that's fine that's a good answer thank you Okay, thank you. The more I say, it's getting worse. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions?
Okay, so if you don't have questions, then we will go quickly now with compression. So, um, Uh, compression is um, supported in the I.O. library. Uh, the Why that is important is that it also supports at reading, right? So if you want to do your own compression outside of the I.O. library, that's fine because you can do whatever you want. You compress your data, you output the compressed data, then you read it back, and then you decompress it the way you want it. The, the drawback of that is, of course, inconvenience, not just because you have to compress and decompress, but also because if you have a neat n-dimensional global array or multiple processes and you start compressing things, then every, in every process you have a one-dimensional array of different size and you have to manage how you want to put this together and then how you read it back together. So the convenience, this putting compression inside audios is that you just write n dimensional data array and you read n dimensional data array with whatever decomposition you want. You both writing and read the different decomposition. And the compression be, the works in the background during the write and during the read. It will compress and decompress on, on each side and then just deliver you the data. So it's for easy of use. Uh, we have the operators. An operator is a class that can edit, that can be created um, and assigned to variables. So the data operator is going to work on the data pointer that you pass in the put function. And, and naturally, they will do some buffering because they have an output. So they will buffer it for audios that will go into the output. And on the read side, uh, you you handle a you hand over a pointer that you allocate it for the actual data. So the operator is going to allocate for, uh, memory for reading in the compressed data, decompress it, and in, add it into the your target uh, user pointer. Uh, so that's what operators do. Um, the operators we have are compression compression operators. Uh, we have ZFP, SZ, and MGAR from the ECP uh, projects supported and lossless compression. We have um, BZIP2 and BLOSC um, uh, as operators. Um, Kitware actually developed uh, another operator which is for en uh, encrypting data. So operators can have different use and that there is one example which is doing different it's and encrypts the variables so in the in the source code what you what you can do is you you define an operator you create an operator object by saying which one do you want um, you're using zfp in this example so we just create a zfp operator and then when we have variables select on the screen, then we add it, the operation, assign it to multiple variables. And there we parameterize the compressor. So accuracy is usually the uh, parameter we use. This example would set a two digit um, uh, accuracy for the ZFP compressor. And then all the data that you get back would be valid to two digits. Uh, but I mean, not accurate until, uh, for two digits. That was not the correct button. The, should I not done that? Just a moment. Okay, so what we can do here is that uh, we have the gs.bp, right? Created this 400 megabyte, 100 output steps. For comparison, let's give it to the PDF calculator. Let's output the input data besides the calculation and use a compressor, SZ, 
with three digit accuracy both for both you and me. Right? So what I'm doing here is I'm setting the PDF analysis output IO group and saying for variable U's and V's applied as the operation. Um, if they exist, if, if these variables are not written, then nothing will happen. So um, if I'm running the PDF calculation now, and we'll say, okay, not just read the data, but all, not just calculate on the data, but write the original data to disk. What is going to done is also write U and V. So uh, you see, if you compare to the GS.BT, we have the, the U and V arrays, 64 cubes, 100 steps. But if you see the size of the data, then the PDF BP is much smaller because uh, ZFP compressed the, well, sorry, SZ compressed is very aggressively. We just, we just asked for three digit accuracy. So which for visualization uh, purposes is it's fine. So now you see that, that it just worked. And if I um, print out data, This was the original data in the, the Grayscott output. I output from the compressed data. Uh, I get the data sets, uh, the points accurate to, to three digits. And if you, if you compare these values with these values, it's, the difference is less than uh, 0 .0, 0 0.001. So yeah, so they, that's all about compression that I wanted to show. It's now the data set is compressed and um, when you read it, it just shows the same thing. So um, did I run the PDF plots yet. Right, so the, the plotting now reads the data. Uh, I'm sorry, that's, that's not that silly made a mistake. So this is just reading the PDFs, not doing, not reading the, uh, if I'm reading the GS plot, now I can read the PDF uh, because it contains the U and V variable. And then there is no way you can see any difference from the, the previous uh, uh, plotting, um, maybe because I forgot to run it and didn't show you, but because on visualization, you cannot see three, more than one digit difference here. So the three digits is perfectly fine. Okay, so that's about compression. Do you have any question on that? Uh, yeah, hi, Norbert. Uh, I just wanted to give a quick note on the, uh, on the, the operators. Um, that compression operator um, that's utilizing something new with Audios 2.8 is a plugin um, infrastructure that allows users to create their own operators. Um, so if there's something that Audios doesn't support that you have some custom algorithms you want to try, then you can kind of create operators as plugins that Audios can then use. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. Yeah, so I'm sorry, I didn't prepare slides on the plugin architecture. Yeah. That's fine. Okay, so if no more questions, um, so the, the vision of Behind Audios is to be the data transfer framework for multiple cases. Uh, so like connecting, moving data from a, an experimental facility into a computing facility to process the experimental data or running workflows, in-situ workflows and connect applications together and, and send data over without touching the file system 
or of course write data to this query where that's desired by the application. And so have different solutions. It's not the same solution, but the same API, same framework for the different tasks of staging and connecting producers and consumers of data. And so we have multiple staging solutions in the Adios framework. And the sustainable staging transport, SST, is our uh, most important staging transport in the sense that this is the most flexible one. This is what we focus on providing all the functionality that, uh, that in Adios we want to. And then we have more specialized uh, staging engines for specific, more specific application use cases. So, and then, so yes, the data man is an engine that is using zero MQ and is targeting the wide area network transfers. Scott showed the, the slides on the K-Star fusion experiment from Korea stream to NERSC. This is what, this is the engine that we use for that and it's optimized for pushing the data through the network into the consumers. SSC was developed specifically for implementing a strong coupling between two application, MPI applications wanting to exchange data as fast as possible. So it's, it's really focusing on, 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 on that. And then we have an inline engine uh, that Kitware they developed Chuck, who was just talking a minute ago. So he, was, he is leading the development of this inline engine specifically to doing the traditional in-situ execution as an execution model in a um, in audio so that you can have the producer running and then the consumer is running inside the so inside the app, the producer application as in the in situ visualizations tools do and is specifically designed for to provide a, a catalyst capable inline engine for paraview so that someone can connect paraview into a running application uh, the Scott mentioned about the SC tutorial and, and the SC tutorial, uh, the tutorial at SC22 will be different from this one. And it will be very much focusing on showing this to have applications with different kind of visualization, uh, in situ visualizations using Paraview, connecting to the application and running inside the application or doing with SST to running as separately, remotely doing interactive visualization. So that will be one of the main biggest uh, new things that's coming with Audios. Okay, so the SST uh, is designed for having multiple parallel producers, multiple parallel consumers exchanging data flexibly. So it's focusing on portability, so that it just runs anywhere, reliability that it it runs well, and that it's it's flexible so that consumers can come and go. They can join an existing stream, read whatever they want. They can disappear. They can abort and die, and then reconnect later and do their stuff again without disturbing the the producer. Besides the the semantics of data exchange. And it's uh, the, the metadata management, managing the connections is separated from the data management. Two have two planes implemented. The control plane does all this flexibility with using, reusing all the concepts that uh, the, we developed over more than a decade with the Adios One uh, framework and the FlexPass. Uh, engine from Georgia Tech and Dimes from Rutgers, and then still using the EVPath software developed by Georgia Tech to manage all these connections and send metadata around to readers, multiple readers. And then there is a data plane uh, specifically just focusing on moving data between a consumer and the producer. And uh, it can use TCP, but better use RDMA and we rely on the Leap Fabric software here to implement RDMA operations uh, to move data around. But there is an effort from Israel to add 
uh, a UCX support there, so there will be an option to use another one if, if Leaf Fabric is not supported. But for ECP, so all the HPK machines use Leaf Fabric, so that's what we are focusing here. Um, so what happens with SSD is that the data is stayed, is buffered on the writer's memory and runs a separate thread to serve all the readers. Um, and the readers can uh, ask for the data and uh, the thread will serve them if it's a TCP based uh, um, staging. If it's using RDMA, then the reader can just remotely get the data out from the, the memory which was buffered. And really the control plane is only used to communicate about the reader getting a step and uh, then finishing a step so that it can, the writer knows when the readers are done with the reading. Um, okay, SSC is specifically, is more specific, it's using MPI. Uh, so you have to run, you have to run the producer and the consumer together in a NPMD mode with one MPI launch. And it's only working with one consumer. It doesn't support two consumers to the one. I mean, when I say one producer, one consumer, they are parallel applications, but you cannot launch two parallel applications to consume data. And you have to run just two codes together in MPMD mode, and then they will use MPI uh, functions, asynchronous functions to, to exchange the data. And it's really targeting the WDM code coupling applications, but anyone can use it for in-situ analysis or, or strong uh, code coupling. Uh, the data man, as I said, is, is, is focusing on moving data on the wide area network. Uh, it's, it's basically built on top of zero MQ as to exchanging data. So yeah, it's using TCP underneath. Um, yeah, yeah, so what, what else should I say? Um, when, when the, of course, it's focusing on specifics like the K-star, as Scott mentioned, it's producing a million frames per second. It's physically impossible to move a million frames individually over a network, not just wide area network, but basically any network. So we only have one option is to aggregate data into blocks and then sending it over. So that's why it's not a real-time staging engine, it's it's for near real time uh, purposes to, to make a get back to get the data with some latency so that you can start processing, but it's not going to give you the, the very fast, the, the immediately the latest data, right? So that's what it, it is doing in the background, uh, but it has three different <coughs> modes. What we use is the push mode here so that the producer is sending out the data to the consumers immediately to reduce the latency as much as possible. But it can work in the, uh, in, uh, the other modes of staging like SSDs in this query mode that the, the consumers decide what they want to read. So they are going to send their request what they want and the, then the sender is going to send the data set that they want. But this is not optimal for wide area network because the latency between sending requests and then receiving data is it's too, too long to do this many times. So that only works when you have a specific, uh, just, just a few steps done, okay? And then I said inline engine is for, to running in end step. It's really just using the fact that the, uh, if we have a step in the put calls, you hand over the pointers from the application to Adios, and in end step, you say, okay, here is all the data, do your output. That gives up gives the, the opportunity to run an other code, the consumer, right in their memory, and then serve all the read requests from those pointers that the application was holding. Uh, was giving to Adios, right? And then when the consumer is done with this begin step, end step, we know that the consumer is done, we return and return to the application and an application can run uh, uh, 
to the next computation step. This is how the traditional institute visualization, the catalyst and Lipsim uh, for part of UN visit has been working uh, for a long time, right? They, you embed, embed code into the application and you do the analysis, the visualization inside the run, basically stopping every step, the application itself doing the analysis and then you continue. Um, right, so, so the audios has this inline engine too. Okay, so what do you want to use if you need wide over? Uh, do you, you, you want to move data between multiple machines, then DataMan is the, the solution for that. Even though SSD can use TCP too, so it's possible, but it has the slower mode of, of querying back and forth, which, which will slow down. So better use DataMan. If you run together, then SSD is usually the answer. Uh, it can use RDMA. Uh, but you have an option for if you have one writer, one reader application, which are highly synchronized, you can use SSC and then you will just use MPI. Uh, I receive, I send functions to make it. The main, per, main option is that you have an other option besides SSD. If SSD doesn't work for some reason, Leap Fabric doesn't work for some reason, or it's just not working fast enough, you have an other option to try for your application. That's basically the main reason why it exists. If you have multiple readers, you want to, you, uh, you want to uh, process the data by multiple readers, then you have to use SSD. Or, or if you are working in AI training, interference, inference, AI inference workflows, you basically SSD is your option, like, collecting data from multiple producers into one consumer who is the training the AI, then you can use SSD for that. Right, that's that's all. So let me show. Norbert, there's a question yeah. about staging between machines over the local area network. I can answer it, but why don't you? Well, yeah, so that's... Um, so the only TCP and so zero MQ works over LAN as well as one. We don't have a, a solution that can use something specific about a local area network, which is not available wide area network. The difference between those when you use TCP is basically the latencies that you, you can have, you can have, right? So, SST will really suffer if you go over wide area network because you send over the queries to get the data you want. Data man is going to push from the, the producers to the consumers and then the consumers are reading, reading their data locally. Uh, hopefully they want all the data, right? So good data man pushes everything and then the consumers may just pick up a single value from that and they are not interested in the whole data set. So you balance that, but we don't have a specific engine that optimized for local area network. Norbert, just explain the JAXA example, because that was local area network. Oh, okay, so I don't have a slide on that, but so, yeah, so one application is uh, uh, JAXA, the Japanese space agency has a, a computer based on the, uh, Fujitsu CPU, so it's vector CPUs, doesn't have GPUs, it has a specialized network, the Tofu network doesn't use Leap Fabric or, or, or others that we can use. It has its own and we don't have a support for that, right? So there is a, the supercomputer is a specialized machine. That's where you run simulations. Uh, the, of course, the, the engineers and scientists, they want to visualize all the, because they simulate rocket launches or uh, CFD applications, uh, whatever. They want to create movies of what's happening and look at that, not just data. They are very uh, heavily using visualization as part of their workflow. So what they have been doing is to output all the data to the parallel file system. And then they have a satellite cluster, a GPU and x86 uh, CPU cluster where they can run visit or paraview uh, and, and run a batch to produce, read the, all the data and then produce all the images and the movies, right? Straightforward. The, the problem is as they scale up on the supercomputers, the parallel file system is really, really the bottleneck. 
for IO, even for slowing down the application to write data. So they want to speed up their simulations by not writing to the disk. And um, they want to also do it interactive visualization. So some, sometimes they do batch visual, oh, sorry, they do batch visualization to produce movies for that you finally see. But usually when they are doing their explorative science, they want interactive visualization to connect from their workstation to the cluster, startup uh, visit and for part of you, they use both and then connect to the data and then figure out what to look at, right? So they, they play around in, in part of you and visit to, to look at stuff. And uh, <clears throat> that's what they want to do with the running simulation and scale of the simulation. So then now the, the solution that we came up with is to run the simulation on the supercomputer, use Adios for staging it to the cluster where we have another application running. And that is having all the data and it's like works like staging to disk. It can write to disk if it wants to, or can use, uh, this could be a application using Libsyn and then you use visit to connect from the workstation to this application and do your remote visualization with it, right? So now we remove the, the storage system as a bottleneck from this visualization uh, workflow. So what we use is SST over the LAN because the two machines are pretty close to each other and, uh, and uh, there is enough time to move the data around. So yeah, so I don't know, without figures, this is, uh, is a hard explanation. So I'm not sure if anyone could follow. So is someone writing any, any other question? Okay, so let me just show this staging. So I already showed you staging through the storage. So we are pretty, we are close to the, you know, finishing the tutorial, uh, these demos. The only thing we want to change now, let's clean up the data so we have no data on anything and change the engine. So let, uh, yeah, let's do SST. We saw the movie in one setting where we are running the analysis and then we can kill it. Uh, but first I want to show you a different thing. So I can run all of these, this whole pipeline and just look back, look for the, the figure that I want to do, right? So I want to run the Grace Cut simulation, the PDF analysis, the PDF plot, and the separate stream on the, the, the GS plots, the plot, uh, making the, plotting the 2D slices. So uh, I'm going to run these all together as a single MPI run. And to not to stress my laptop, I'm running everything on a single process, but these are all parallel applications. Okay, so what you can see for a while is that, we, we, okay, this pipeline is running, right? So we launch four applications in the same MPI world and they are running together and well, oh, sorry, that they finished pretty pretty uh, similarly. What what? Uh, I need the simulation finish. No, oh. sorry. So let's run it again. We, they don't have any data output because everything went through staging. Watch how. The, we don't get all the plots, right? So all of them running together and the pipeline doesn't slow down the simulation. Simulation goes fast, but you get every 50 or so, every 60 of the output to, I mean, every six output to be plot. 
because the, the Python script is the slowest uh, here. And we don't slow down the simulation with SST by default because it's focusing on, okay, so what is happening? The simulation just discards all the data that the reader is not reading. So if the readers are slow, then they are not going every get every step. They just get the latest step in this stream and then they can plot. Uh, I mean, they get the step what is available to them and then they will plot it. So steps are missing here. This is the focusing on, okay, the application, we don't want to slow down the simulation. We just want to get some of the data, look at the latest stuff, it's working fine. The, if you want to do, actually, you need all the steps. You don't want to lose data. And if your analysis is slow, you are willing to sacrifice the parallel application, then it's just a policy change for SST. You can say, block the producer to produce the, to be produced. So now what you can see is that we're getting the plot for every single step, but the simulation is progressing much slower because it's waiting a, a lot of time for the two readers, the GS plot and uh, the PDF calculator analysis code to finish reading. And, uh, and then handing over to the other one. So now our workflow is slowing down the simulation, but we get all the steps that we wanted. So these are two options with, with SST. And the, and the other thing is we can, this, these things can die if they are not running in MPMD mode and they can reconnect later. I'm going to show that at the end, but this is, was one thing that I really wanted to show here. And especially because uh, if I do SSC, SSC is the other engine. I can, what I cannot do with SSC, uh, by the way, this was compressing the variables on the fly, but that, that was must because I didn't start from scratch, but that doesn't matter. So changing the SSC engine, what it cannot do is to have one stream and two consumers. So I cannot run the analysis and the GS group together. So I'm only going to redo the pipeline, the one pipeline. So run the simulation, the analysis, and the plotting. So in MPMD mode, I launch three processes here. The first two will going to use SSC to exchange the simulation data. And then the second and third will do use another SSC stream to exchange the, the visualization, the, the histograms. Uh, okay, the plotting is behind. So again, this is SSC, and this SSC can only run in the synchronized mode, right? The data is exchanged with MPI every single step. So it's really good for synchronized, highly synchronized code coupling purposes. In this case, it shows you that, okay, you don't have an option. The simulation is slowed down here because the slowest party will uh, is the ruler. So uh, I don't I just, so I don't remember if I showed did I show you already with DP5. So I can do the same thing through the storage. run the entire pipeline through files. It's happening this almost the same way. What's, what you can see is that the, the reader is getting a, a bunch quickly and then there is nothing. That's the, because the, the polling of the, read, the consumer looking at the file system, if the, is there a new step, is there a new step? There is a, a one second default polling time there, not to stress the file system too much. And so it's in this fast demo will produce like five, six steps in within that second. So it is too fast to show you the benefits of this. But uh, And now you see 
This is the other option. The simulation didn't slow down because it's through files. So you the, the flow consumers are going to read on their own step. And actually I have the two pipeline running with different speed on this laptop. So one will finish earlier than the other. So just to summarize, SST is the one where you have the option of control. Who is the, who has the right uh, to, to no, I mean, who, who rules the workflow execution, either the simulation not slowing down or the pipeline getting all the steps and processing it. But with files, you get one way, the SSC, you get the other way. Okay, and so finally, the last part of the demo is just to show you Go back to the. Let's go back to this start mode so that the simulation can run freely, and we use SST. Now we will run them in a separate windows so that they are independent, and we will run and set up, which is just running for a long, long time and all putting every single step. So it will run really fast. So now it's this still just launching the same pipeline, but now as four separate applications, right? And it's using SSD. So they are going to wait for the stream to become available. Uh, I messed up something here. Ah. Let me kill everything because I just messed up. If I read the correct name, use the different name. So everything clean. So now let's start again. Okay, so finally we have the full, full pipeline running. Um, and as you see, this is this card mode. So the simulation is really producing every single iteration step. And then the, the pipeline is, is much, much slower. So you will you know, get uh, um, you know, 40, 40 steps, every 40th step to be processed. And I can kill part of the pipeline if I kill the analysis. Then this part of the pipeline dies, but the, the simulation unaffected and the other, other analysis code is unaffected. They just continue. And then I can start it up. Um, the other place. So they will reconnect to the same stream. And then now they are producing the data again from what, what the data is available. All the data that was written is discarded. Most of the data is discarded, so they can only just see the latest data from coming from the GS, uh, the Grayscale simulation. So, so I can kill the pipeline, and if I kill the simulation, then they will finish the processing and look it nicely. And so we don't have, besides what connection information that hanging around because I killed stuff that's just have a connection information but nothing else. Okay, so that concludes all my demos and the presentations. So what I personally think is with audios is that it's um, it gives it creates one interface and the framework to, to create producers and a workflow for producing and consuming data. And this interface is not focused on files. It's focused on producers, consumers, and it works over staging as well as through file systems. So in kind, it's in some kind, it provides a bridge. It's a, a framework to provide a bridge from 
the current state, or I mean, for many, most of people, current state is to, to the file-based processing of running simulations, running analysis codes, running visualization codes, moving experimental data to the HPC center, and then comparing the data with the simulations, processing it in some workflow to the future where they are increasingly are going to use online processing to avoid the bottleneck of the story the storage system this this is coming for every application at just at a different time as scott showed with the evolution of all the hardware the storage doesn't keep up with the computing capabilities and more and more applications are hitting that wall and there is you know that's the only way that we can go i mean you, you can work with data reduction to reduce the data sizes so that we can avoid hitting the wall but uh, we eventually we have to go into online institute processing and and only write to storage the data that we actually permanently want to be stored not all the data that we are producing and so that's why i think the audios brings in uh, as a value for the ECP community to be this bridge and, and help with this transition. So I stop talking. Uh, if I will answer questions, and if you don't have any questions, then this will conclude our tutorial today. Thank you. Norbert, why don't you turn your video on? I can turn my video on. Right. I see different people who survived, um, you know, I mean, one of the things, um, you know, one of the things that we've seen just to try to summarize a little, and this is, this is a little complicated that we've noticed some applications have very, um, I'll say interesting or complex IO patterns like from E3SM. And one of the things we saw is there is a bad way of using IDEOS to read, which can give you very bad reading performance when you read things back. And then there's good ways. And you know, it's easy for any IO framework that you can do bad, um, you can have bad behavior. And that's what we saw with E3SM, correct, Norbert? Right. And and what what what's bad behavior is, for example read each individual element from array back one by one, close the file and then read again. That's what we'll call bad. And of course, no matter what IO framework you have, it's not gonna work well. But you know, when you get good, I mean, so Adios is built kind of, so you know, if you have good behavior in you know, what I'll call, which should be the norm, but you should be able to get very good performance for both writing and reading. And we've had numerous papers, which are not just our papers, but they're actually with application scientists. Um, so, so what we'll say is again, that you know, file IO is not going away. We have to make sure that's fast, but when you can just go from file-based IO and make no changes, put in compression in the middle of it and ma make sure that when you have compression, it's just by default going to work in parallel. I mean, if you're gonna include in situ viz, don't change your application codes, have ways that you can just use this, you know, this concept of engine. So, you know, we, we would love to have feedback um, and feedback's not always good. Feedback could be, I wish you guys did this better, or you know, could you guys support this? So feedback is very important for us because that's how we can prioritize work. So you know, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to us, especially with Norbert. Um, are there any questions, comments that you can give us, which for us would be very helpful for as we move, you know past this date further into ECP and beyond. I had a question about your HDF5 ball. Uh, do you plan on supporting hyperslab 
uh, references selection in the future? I don't know exactly what you mean by hyper slab. Can you be more well, specific? So, uh, okay. I, I mean, because it, it depends. We have subsets and we have queries. Right. So but if, is, a, if an HDF5 application uses hyper slab selection, it's my understanding that you can't use the, the Edios ball to use that, correct? Or no? That's that's right. Yeah, so Adios in the API doesn't have hyperslabs, right? So to stride the reads. Right. So I, you mean stride it then? Stride it block, right. It's HDF5 means, yeah, to use the hyperslab selection mechanism. Right. Because we could subset, we can query. Um, but in general, we didn't like strides because essentially, you know, that can that can really give you really bad behavior for IO. I mean, I'm not sure like when people do that and they write strided, you know, can they get multiple terabytes per second? Because that there there is challenges with that, which is why some things we did not really want to support. Norbert, you can go in more detail if you want. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is basically a tug of war between philosophies. So our stance, what we are trying to do with the Audios API is to try to enforce good behavior to get good performance. But if someone doesn't conform it, that's a trouble, right? Mm -hmm. But in HDF5, you can do anything you want because it's, it's the API lets you do everything. So, but the, so that's, that's, the, that's an issue. And we are facing this that uh, we have to more and more add features that are going against the, the top performance versus the convenience of providing some functionality to the users. So providing hyper slabs would be exactly on, on that path along is doing it for the sake of being able to read the use audios with applications that use hyper slabs in HDF5, right? Right. So, so, the, okay. so the yeah, the, that's the that's the thing. Um, so right now you don't plan on implementing. So right now we don't have any plans to do that. But uh, yeah, okay. I mean, you know, we we are really pushed by applications all the time. So if there is an application like this and saying this is what we need, that changes the yeah. picture. Right? Yeah. So I mean, most app most applications that use ACF five are using hyper, especially for parallel I/O, are using some sort of hyperslab selection, point selection type of thing. But, but that's 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 the thing that I'm not. We do allow so you can have subset the data, you can read back a plane, you can write, you know. So we have all that capability. But for example, strides, we don't have because we're scared that if people do that, they're going to get poor performance. So so we can. I mean, we do all the time. We read back just the two D slices. We read back a sub volume. All that in Adios is possible, right? I'm but just, it's it's the strides. It's the strides. So so which meaning? I'm just referring to be, the vol. I'm not I'm not referring to Adios in general. I'm referring to the vol that you've developed to write HDF five. Well, so so I'm not to use, use Adios with HDF five. I was referring to that vol. I'm not referring to Adios in general. Oh, okay. So, so we don't have in the vol layer subsets, Norbert. I thought we did. No, the question was not specific. The hyperslab is more general well, right. than the subset. So, what we can support, support. What we cannot, we cannot. So, and that's what Scott is asking. And Scott Breffel is asking if we are going to implement. The full the journal. HDF hyperslip. So yeah, so that all applications using HDF5 API would be able to read back or even write and read back audio files with the hyperslabs. Correct. That's the, the basic question. Yeah. Well, so, so the, the talk of war is that we didn't want to do that for audio applications because we know that if we let them to use, then the performance will tank. And so even for the, those HDF5 applications, the real the question is why would you want to use the audios wall layer when it's not going to give you benefits over using HDF5, uh -huh. other wall layers or the default ones, because you are bottlenecking your application IO by uh, massaging data in memory instead of doing actual IO. So 
it's really the cost benefit is, is, is questionable. We could implement it, but maybe the solution is saying those applications don't shouldn't use Adios because it's not going to benefit them. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. But if it would, then yeah, of course, we just need one example where it would actually help it and then that would change the whole balance, right? So. Right. Mm -hmm. Thanks. There was also a question from Weiting about BP5 being documented. Uh, I'm sorry, what's going we can ask the question will the bp5 file format oh, yeah, so I've been, be available? Yeah, right, right so i've been asking uh, answering the question so for the the group so like um uh, for the open pmd guys requests they have ordered the group as a virtual thing uh a read api for parsing the the hierarchy with groups as with hdf5 on the read side but we didn't add it to the right side so you don't create group of group objects of variables to add it into a hierarchy so that is a no but on the read side it already exists and it makes sense for thinking for the future to add that to the right side too it's really just for convenience it doesn't change anything from performance wise um and then uh, okay so the Baking the BP5 format specification. Yeah, so we, we don't have that uh, ready yet, but yes, we should we should uh, have that. And um, the list of parameters I showed you on that on the read the docs for each engine, there is the enumeration of the parameters and describing which one does what. That, that's to Caillou, and so uh, you didn't find that? Um, can an attribute be modified, overwrite? Yes, it can be overwritten. This is a new, again, a new thing in 2.8, and again, requested by the Open PMD guys. You can see that uh, when we add new features, it's coming from some application demand, not just request, but really saying, ah, we cannot do stuff without uh, doing something. So. By default, attributes are not modifiable. You create it as a label for a variable or for the data set for the entire run. But now it's possible to, when you declare a very an attribute, say this is modifiable, uh, just pass a, a Boolean flag, and then you can redefine it later and it goes into the file. However, this gives a, a conflict in concept. How do you read this back? If you read this back in a stream step by step, then you will get the first value of the attribute in the beginning. And then when it was changed in a given step, then you will see that one. If you open as it as a file and you want to see all the, the, the just the value of the step as with the, the BPLS, you see all the steps at once, then you only see the final value of the attribute, right? That's the option. So then you, you lose the track what was the value of an attribute before. If this fits your purpose, then the answer is yes, you can modify attributes. Um, and then, so Mar Marta, you have a special quest? Yeah, we still have. Yes, time. eventually, uh, so just to try to understand your the latest demo where you were doing the in real time analysis. So um, consider a run that is a 24 hour run, and obviously you won't be able to monitor it during the whole time. And also can be a run that you submit in batch and runs over the weekend. So I'm trying to understand when you when you submit your normal run, it's calculating things that you need to do these uh, analysis on the side, correct? Or is it activating whatever you need for the analysis on the side at the time of the analysis is being asked for? Like for example, is to to know if um, what is the impact in performance. Um, I don't know if I'm expressing myself. Uh, so, so maybe I can I see if I can. I mean, I think I. I mean, let's let me see if I can explain it because I'm not sure. I mean, from the applications perspective, you could be having something which is using what Norbert Demage SST. What's going to happen is you're going to publish the data. If there's nothing there to subscribe to the data, there's a few things that could happen. You could program it such that it goes to a file. 
So if there's no connection, you can go to a file, okay? That's a little complicated, but that can happen. Or what you can do is that you can have it such that just nothing happens. So you could be running and you could have a, you know, a 24 hour job that seven hours later, you could connect. That data goes over to the other job once you could connect and then it computes whatever it wants to compute. So, the, so, so, um, so in other words, it won't slow down the application again, unless you tell it without a connection, stop. And if you program it that way, then that that's bad if you know that you're not going to always connect. Okay, thank so, you. Because I think you you were showing maybe I'm connecting to different things. You were showing one of the demos was slowing down a little bit the normal run. So I don't know if it was uh, uh, related right, to but, that or not. No, no. I mean, it, if he runs on a laptop, which as he runs on a laptop and runs Zoom things are slow and there's only a certain amount of processes, but the simplistic way of looking at it is that you write your job and you have 128 nodes, and then you leave one node in reserve. And now when you leave that node in reserve, if that's where you're running the staging, then it won't slow it down. So, but if, so, you, if you want to use the 128 nodes, because taking one node, right. Or imagine a big facility like one of the LCFs right. uh, is a, is a, is a, an important. <laughs> well, right, we're at Oak Ridge, so so imagine, like for example, for um, the WDM app, one of the things is that we took um, four nodes out of four thousand, so the overhead is pretty small, right? But if it's one out of, if you're only going to run on two nodes and you take one, that is a lot but you could just use one core, for example, if that makes sense. So you have 42 cores on say Summit, what's one core if you take one core at 42? So you could run that way as well. I'm not, so, I'm not sure if I'm making sense to you or not. No, no, I, I'm just trying to understand how it works. I, I am by far so, not an expert. So, so, I, <laughs> yeah, so I'd like to clarify more. So thank you, Scott, for exp explaining that because I didn't talk about that part. Uh, but just want to clarify because you, you asked about the last real-time demo. So what I wanted to try to convey in the demo and changing the SSD from blocking to uh, discard mode to blocking mode to talk about there are, when you run an in-situ pipeline, you have a producer, you have a consumer. Then there are two things can happen. The consumer might be slower or, or faster than the producer. If it, the consumer is faster than the producer, it will consume all the data, process all the data before the producer gives the next one, right? So it's easy. But if the consumer is slower for whatever reason, because you put them on the same nodes and it doesn't, and you run them on the same core on a laptop and it's slower, or it's just running on uh, four separate nodes, but it's actually not enough to uh, finish in time before the simulation has the next data step, is to what do what do you want to do? You have to make this decision before you run the pipeline. So either you say, I don't want the simulation to slow down. I want it to produce, run the 24 hours, produce as long history as it's possible. And I want to process it with gaps. And I just want to see images, whatever, every seven, every 10, every 15, whatever steps. Or you say, data, the output data is important to me. I need every single step for my analysis to converge, to properly run, or I need to see all the steps and I don't care if the simulation slows down, right? So you, you decide this, how you want to run it. It's nothing to do with others. It's that's really just the runtime of consumer, runtime of producer comparison. And that's what I wanted to, to show in the demo that you have, you have this option to pick. It's not forced on you which one you have to live with, you can pick with SSD, you want the consumer to be fast, uh, to have all the steps or the producer be fast and not bothered with the consumer. That's all I tried to say. And so your question was kind of independent from that, but it, so as Scott explained, that's really about picking the right number of nodes, extra nodes in, your, in the center. 
Yeah, the, this helps. So basically, uh, the user will have to decide before any submission. It's not something that he can change during the during the run. He needs to allocate at least on node or course for this in situ uh, analysis. But, but that, that's not exactly true. Kind of more for Scott for going into the research. So in the tutorial, we present audios as a as a product that you can do. But then when you have this kind of questions like that it's just oh, okay we have lots of research partners so go ahead Scott so no 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 I mean it's a really good question and everything's like what are you trying to do and like for for example things that you can do which is you could take as we said an extra core per node or a few cores per node so that there's no problems with doing that. So you don't need an extra node. Now, the problem is that if you do that and you run some sort of analysis, if that analysis has some sort of, say, collective or communication, you probably realize that could run really poorly because you're going to run on the same number of nodes as the application. So a lot of it's based upon what is the concurrency expectations for the analysis for how you run. So if, if you know, like one of our examples is like a common thing is you're computing streamlines. And if you have a domain decomposition across every, you know, every node for your application, streamlines is not good. It, it's, you know, there's just way too much communication. So what our visualization partners will do is they're going to stage that on one node if it fits or even one GPU say on summit. So you'll take seven cores, perhaps one GPU and that's one process. Now, of course, there, there's other things that can easily be done, which is you can stage and then from the staging, it can then try to send over the wide area network using data man. So then it's basically an asynchronous process. Or if you don't want to, if you if you don't want to waste those resources, you could do the inline engine, which you know Norbert really didn't go over too well, but that's what Kitworth's been developing. The problem is if that inline takes long, or if it actually uses memory, which they generally use memory, you could have cache pollution, and you could find that you can get a bigger slowdown by doing inline. So you're not using extra resources, but that's time taking away from the application. So it really, it all depends. So all these different modalities we do support, but it's too difficult to really say what you should do without knowing what you're trying to do. I don't know if all that makes sense. No, no, it helps. It, it just, I want maybe potentially clarify with two uh, scenarios. So I'm, the question comes from a, a particular code. So in this case, the code, has to have the same number of nodes, the same number of cores from the beginning to end. So they cannot change. Uh, imagine that they, they have to, to get the simulation for the supernova. They need to start from the beginning with, I don't know, 1,024 1, nodes. And then all the physical time that the re simulation represents, it will be at the same size. So I, I will not be able, except if I, for a particular setup in the code, I'm, I might be able to allocate an extra node or whatever is necessary to do this. But in other contexts, we have a different scenario, uh, which is right now the facilities, the maximum time that they allocate for wall time is in general 24 hours, most of the time. I mean, in the, the, I'm talking about big scale, uh, again, like in the ACP uh, exascale machines and LCF contest. Um, so in the future, and maybe that, that limit goes into, um, into a two days or three days uh, timeline for the world time. In those cases, there are some codes that could adapt and, and change because of imagine uh, adapted mesh refinement or whatever they have inside. They can change the number of cores or nodes and when you need the in real time visualization, activate that. Uh, so they don't waste the extra nodes all the time, like in the three days window, for example. So but my cases or examples are very specific. It's just to, to try to understand what you are doing and potentially 
Sure. Um, get uh, get but, better knowledge of what can be done to improve. Uh, so right, and I don't know if this is like the flash code or one of the no, other puzzles. No, it's, it's for NAX. Okay. It's a particular. Okay. Uh, so code. so 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 what I was going to say is, I mean, you know, again, we can look at the warp X code or pick on GPU and look at how are they doing it because you know all all of our customers, if you want to say, are running at very large scales. So like, for example, in the XGC code, we took four extra nodes to do a lot of, um, if you wanna say, you know, staging processes that were constantly running for this analysis and visualization. So yes, that- but, but excuse me, um, that's what Marta was pointing out that she doesn't want to have four nodes allocated for an uh, entire day as an extra stuff. and. I was talking about adaptively allocating resources for something that they well, want. Oh, well, right. So the but inline heating would be an option for that. So if you want para viewing or something um, to, well, I'm not sure if that's adaptive, but uh, that can just run inside uh, potentially by demand, doing stuff by demand, not always. But. Uh, right. We are not, the workflows that I was running here all was fixed. Every process was fixed. Every application was fixed and running on their allocation. So there was no adaptiveness uh, of moving around using the same set of resources adaptively. Sure. Yeah, thank you. It was just uh, an idea considering so, so the, the current applications that I face uh but but what i was trying to say and let me state it again what could easily happen similar to what we do with jaxa you can have data that connects and basically if you're on say another machine you can then connect on that other machine at periodic times and then the data will be sent over to that other machine and now off you go so when you launch the other process on the other machine, the connection will exist. I mean, there, there's things that could be done. They're a little tricky, but they can be done. And that is the Jack's example, what you're asking. That is what they're doing. So I'm not, so I'm saying it is possible, but again, that requires more effort. Yeah, okay, sorry, you are, you are right, it's possible it's on the same machine too, if you, if you just run a second application, like an interactive job on a node, and now you connect for an hour, and then you go home, then you create, create. That's like Correct, Norbert. Technology possible. Sorry, I was misunderstanding, thinking about a single job, running on a thousand node, and do adaptive things inside that job. That's not what we do right now. But that, right, and so, so what all I'm trying to say is what you're asking is possible, it's just a little trickier, but it is possible. And the, you know, the scientists at Jackson Japan do that. So, sorry, I didn't mean, mean to make it complicated. It is just possible. No, thank you. Thank you. This is very useful. At least uh, it helps me understand what are the possibilities. And, uh, and thank you so much for all the tutorial. It has been very useful. Yes, thank okay. you. So time is up, Scott. We need to finish. Yeah, I know. Trust me. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.